The SCP Foundation has faced a number of wide, potentially apocalyptic threats in its mission to uphold normalcy and save humanity. We know the SCP Foundation could be ruthless in this mission. The events of SCP-5000 before Agent Pietro restarted the universe show what happens when the Foundation is pushed to its final decisions regarding normalcy being upheld. In SCP-5000, it seemed that the SCP Foundation decided to seize research further into the anomaly they needed to neutralize. But what would have happened if they didn't? In any case, we know the SCP Foundation is dedicated to normalcy and the containment of the anomalous. But what happens when the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision? Uphold normalcy or destroy their universe? The multiverse is a concept in science fiction that has gained mass amounts of popularity over recent years, especially recently thanks to a certain wall crawlers movie. Multiverses are parallel universes that are similar or extremely different from the main ones. Scientists have pondered over the existence of a multiverse for hundreds of years, with the most popular being the many worlds interpretation, a theory of quantum mechanics that states there are many worlds that exist in parallel at the same space and time as our own. Some interpretations even state that every decision a person makes causes a branch in reality where the person made the other decision. We're familiar with the SCP Foundation's run-ins with the multiverse, from SCP-2935-0 Death, a cave that allows the Wanderer to enter a parallel dimension that's fully and completely dead, only for the same thing to happen to their own world once they return through the cave, or SCP-1437, a hole that allows the Foundation to send, receive, and read parallel dimensional documentation from other multiversal SCP Foundations. Combine those two concepts with an SCP-001 proposal. The importance of an SCP-001 proposal is not lost on the Foundation. Researchers of the SCP Foundation save the SCP-001 slot for only the most dangerous, apocalyptic, or widespread anomalies that could affect the Foundation itself, humanity, and normalcy. Arbolic's SCP-001 proposal and the research within its file found the answer to the question we posed above. When the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision, do they uphold normalcy or destroy their universe and all the people who live in it? The file begins somewhat different from what we're used to with SCP Foundation files. Instead of an item number or containment procedures, we begin with a yellow notice from the Records and Information Security Administration, or RASA for short. The notice states that the following file was received in 2026 from Dimension R42. Is Dimension R42 potentially the cause of SCP-001? Could they be attacking this version of the SCP Foundation? The notice continues with the description of the file that follows it. It states, the file below describes an anomaly threatening all members of humankind in all of the multiverse. This file had been emitted to this version of the SCP Foundation for eight minutes as an extremely dangerous cognito hazard, classified as a Class V cognito hazard capable of easily destabilizing and penetrating this universe. However, it was found to not be dangerous, only reading as a danger level zero. While this Foundation was unable to quickly counteract this cognito hazard, it appeared to not pose a threat to the affected universe's humankind. Part of this notice is crossed out, indicating that it is no longer true. There is a high threat of repeated cognito hazardous or other forms of attack from Dimension R42. Instead, this part has been replaced with the following fact. Dimension R42 no longer exists. Did this version's SCP Foundation fall to SCP-001? Their entire universe no longer exists, so perhaps this file that this dimension's SCP Foundation received could be a potential warning. Under this race and notice, the reader is not greeted with the standard Foundation documentation yet again. Instead, it seems that the original senders of this file left a note for the readers of this file. It says, Greetings. You are reading this dossier in a paradimension of the relict dimension R42. Due to the colossal size of your world's address, for your convenience, your dimension will be hereafter referred to as PD. Paradimensions? It seems as though we're reading this SCP-001 file through the eyes of the SCP Foundation in this so-called paradimension. 
So if the original SCP Foundation and their universe, R42, is now destroyed, what does this mean for us? The note continues. The following message has been constructed by the SCP Foundation of the Relic Dimension R42 and is addressed to the SCP Foundation of Paradimension PD. Enclosed you will find information about SCP-001, which is a threat to the multiverse. Here we go. SCP-001 is definitely the cause of R42's destruction, but how can we be so sure of this? Maybe SCP-001 caused the Foundation to destroy their universe. The note also includes the following statement. As you may have noticed, this message was preceded by a burst signal containing a non-dangerous cognito hazard. The burst signal was constructed in such a way that minimal change to the signal would have caused indiscriminate and overwhelming casualties among the denizens of PD. As you can see, R42 is capable of eliminating the absolute majority of PD denizens, but has not exercised this capability. In the context above, we ask you to consider this action not as an act of aggression, but as a demonstration of the fact that R42 has no pretension for conquest or other forms of aggression towards PD. Take the following information in earnest. Well, at least this version of the SCP Foundation is being somewhat friendly with the paradimension. If R42's SCP Foundation needs to quell this multiversal threat though, why are they leaving it up to an SCP Foundation that may not be so inclined? The SCP-001 file begins with the object class. This anomaly is of the joint class of Paradox Apollyon. We know from SCP-001 when day breaks, or SCP-3999, that Apollyon class anomalies are extremely dangerous, posing an immediate and almost unstoppable threat to normalcy the SCP Foundation, all of humanity, or even the universe itself. The paradox part is interesting. What exactly is paradoxical about an Apollyon class anomaly? A footnote explains this for us. This anomaly's distinguishing feature is that, in order to eliminate the anomaly that will inevitably eliminate mankind, it is imperative to eliminate mankind or release another K-class event. Oh boy. It seems that the SCP Foundation of R42 was not eliminated by SCP-001. They eliminated themselves to contain SCP-001. Is this paradimension faced with this decision now? The containment procedures of the SCP file continue on this note. The only way to contain SCP-001 and prevent a ZK-class cross-reality failure event is the annihilation of humankind. K-class scenarios are not a concept used lightly by the SCP Foundation. We're familiar with the Omega K-class scenario when we are completely rid of death, or XK-class end of the world scenarios, so we know the danger these anomalies hold to humankind, normalcy, and the world. The SCP Foundation will do anything to prevent these scenarios from occurring, apparently even including the elimination of all humankind or entire universes. The description goes more in depth on the SCP-001 anomaly. SCP-001 consists of all living members of the Homo sapiens species living within dimension R42 and the paradimension, or PD for short. It seems as though this anomaly was created out of a mistake from dimension R42 and PD. As the description states, the anomaly first came into existence and developed in the relic dimension R42 and later activated in PD by accident. How could this have happened? Are these dimensions linked much more closely than we first thought? Let's continue with the description to find more information. Scarily, this portion of the description contains a note that states that unchecked growth of SCP-001 will cause the annihilation of the entire multiverse. The SCP foundations of Dimension R42 and PD are not met with this decision, as now the entire multiverse is at risk. The R42 SCP Foundation has done immense research on the topic of the multiverse of their universe. After the Big Bang, a finite number of universes were created, only 57 to be exact. However, only one dimension was able to form humanity, Dimension R42, and it's unknown why this happened. But all we know is that with the destruction of R42 and the potential annihilation of PD, humanity will cease to exist in the multiverse. The danger of SCP-001 
is that it has the anomalous capability for wide-scale replication of paradimensions. We are reading this article from one of these paradimensions, so this SCP Foundation is technically an anomaly that must contain itself. A paradimension is defined as a parallel reality that has an extremely small deviation from its parent dimension. In this case, PD is a paradimension of R42. It seems that these paradimensions form as a result of human decision-making. So if you've ever been between a type of shirt to buy or were confused on an exam and guessed a question, a paradimension could have formed from this decision, where the paradimension has you take the other choice. Because of this, dimensions housing living instances of SCP-001 uncontrollably grow a colossal number of minimally differing paradimensions every second. No sign of paradimensions have been found in the other 56 parent dimensions. The picture on this file shows how PD has branched from R42, but at this point, it seems that millions if not billions or trillions of paradimensions now exist. The real problem of paradimensions is that the multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions that can exist, and once that is crossed, the ZK-class cross-reality failure event will begin, and the multiverse will be destroyed. The R42 Dimensions SCP Foundation has also discovered that once humankind emerges in the paradimension, they can begin to have paradimensions themselves. The ZK-class cross-reality failure event can be expected to begin between 4 to 2 months from the PD receiving this message. To summarize, SCP-001 is humankind specifically its decision-making. When a person makes a decision, a paradimension may be created. The multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions it can have, and since paradimensions can have paradimensions, they are quickly approaching the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. The SCP Foundation of R42 is approximately 17 years ahead of PD, which allowed them to research and develop containment procedures to contain the anomaly and save the multiverse. R42's SCP Foundation discovered SCP-001 five years before writing the file we're reading now. Aside from that, they developed two operations, Castling and Minimal Gain, to slow paradimension creation and prevent the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. In Stage 1 of Operation Minimal Gain, the Foundation began with neutralizing and decommissioning all of their contained anomalies under the classification of Euclid or Keter, specifically those that were expensive to contain or requiring high levels of personnel and researchers. Stage 2 saw Operation Castling be commenced. The R-42 SCP Foundation launched rockets with variant C Global Amnestic Dispersing Warheads and took control over all countries in order to hold power over all humankind. In Stage 3, the Foundation began to move their world to a more natural state destroying all hazardous, radioactive, chemical, and bacteriological objects, removing dams, and stopping oil extractions. During Stage 3, Stage 4 began. The R42 SCP Foundation began eliminating humanity in third world countries by use of viral and biological attacks. Stage 5 was a wider spread attack on humanity, where the SCP Foundation added deactivation-resistant viral agents to water treatment and collection plants, food products, medication, and household items of developed countries. By Stage 6, only 0.1% of humanity remained, and they were targeted with drone strikes or put into concentration camps for elimination. Stage 7. Of the remaining survivors, the Foundation sampled them to find the fittest of those left to preserve humankind. Stage 8 saw 15,000 of these people put into indefinite cryosleep, and the remaining survivors were eliminated. Stage 9 saw the destruction of the remaining SCP Foundation personnel. We move on to a list of proposals that were made before or during Operations Castling and Minimal Gain. Proposals rejected include the use of SCP objects or other technologies to eliminate derivative dimensions, the development of nanobots with the capability to control human decision-making capabilities and eliminate variability, full replacement of humanity with bionic hybrids acting explicitly within standard behavioral models, unification of humanity into a neural network with control given to an AI control unit, and the destruction of Earth and or all of its inhabitants. While most of these seem like clear solutions that would prevent the elimination of humanity at the SCP Foundation's hand, these proposals were all rejected for one reason. The SCP Foundation did not 
have enough time. One proposal was accepted, however, the use of SCP-0000. This appears to be the solution the R-42 SCP Foundation concocted to fight SCP-001 and potentially save the multiverse. It poses the question, if the R-42 SCP Foundation used this same anomaly to contain SCP-001, as proven by the fact they no longer exist, will PD do the same? The file explains that the R-42 SCP Foundation opened a dimensional wormhole into PD, as they do not know at the time if paradimensions could cause the creation of more paradimensions. In doing this, the SCP Foundation seemingly infected PD with the ability to create paradimensions. The author of this file goes on to explain that the R-42 SCP Foundation had plans to attack PD and use Operations Castling and Minimal Gain in the dimension. However, they could not access the dimension again, and they believe that the Foundation personnel of PD would have made use of Thaumiel class anomalies to save themselves and their world. A note from R-42's Overseer Council is left for PD. If the Apollyon destruction was not enough, the Overseer Council is involved. The importance of the neutralization of this anomaly cannot be forgotten, so the Overseer Council explained to PD. The world has existed before us and must remain after us. Our multiverse is ill, and the name of the illness is humanity, SCP-001. The only way out is SCP-0000 will cease to become a threat with its help. It is in our power to leave a chance for other sapient species that, perhaps, will not be affected by the same anomaly, or will find a way to get rid of it before it's too late. We, the O5 Council, and other survivors from R42 have chosen our fate. We hope you will do the same. What is this SCP-0000? How did the SCP Foundation of R42 find this solution? The file for SCP-0000 is placed within this SCP-001 file. SCP-0000 is a Paradox Thaumiel class anomaly without any containment procedures. SCP-0000 is a device that, once activated, will destroy the universe it was activated in. It will also destroy all paradimensions that are not creating other paradimensions. As such, PD would not be destroyed. However, the billions or trillions of other paradimensions the R42 parent dimension created will be destroyed. PD is left with a harrowing decision to continue living, or destroy itself, to save the rest of the multiverse. In the file, a note from R42's Joan Simpson is written for an SCP Foundation Overseer, 05-1. As part of Operations Castling and Minimal Gain, the remaining Foundation employees were allowed one family member to uphold morale. Joan is not writing for R42's 05-1. Instead, she's writing for PD's 05-1, this dimension's version of her father. She begins with wondering whether she can call this version of 05-1 her father, as her version of her father recently passed away. She remembers the day the Foundation employees were allowed to choose that one family member they would save for the time being. Her father was opposed to allowing two family members, as he claimed it would cause unnecessary stress and schisms among the remaining few hundred Foundation staff. 05-1 chose to have Joan over her mother, and she understood everything by the look in his eyes, and grew angry, but that feeling is long gone now. She began to work with her father and the remaining Foundation personnel that called themselves hostages behind the backs of those higher up the ranks. On days she felt sad, Joan and her father would go up to the surface of the earth in hazmat suits, sitting on the grass and watching over the empty city at the bottom of the mountain. No humanity remained with the only life she could see being birds. Her father promised her that they'd return there and build a giant monument to humanity at the center of the city. She knew this was a lie. Joan remembers when someone proposed that they should open a portal, the one that opened to PD. This was their fatal mistake, as after that the paradimension began replicating paradimensions. The countdown went down to months again and the promise he made to his daughter became impossible. 05-1 died and left the position vacant. 
Joan says to the PD's 05-1 that she doesn't care whether they destroy their world or not, or whether the universe will continue to exist, or if there will be new life in it. Her world was crushed long ago. The note also reads the following. It's good that this message is encrypted with your key that was passed on to me, or these lines would have been deleted. Everyone wants to save the world, but who needs it like this? Empty and cold, without those to appreciate its beauty, without humanity, do whatever you think is right. I truly feel better now. Love you. Faithfully yours, Joan Simpson. We're not too sure if PD went through with destroying their universe to save the multiverse, but it seems that whatever decision was made would cause the destruction of that universe, whether that be through the use of SCP-0000 or the ZK-class cross-reality failure event, humanity will cease. But maybe if they make the decision to use SCP-0000, sapient life can begin to exist again, and hopefully, no paradimensions will be made from their decisions. Decisions are an extremely innate part of humanity. You decided to get out of bed this morning. You decided to open up your computer or phone, and you decided to watch this video. Who knows the amount of paradimensions we may have created today. But in our world, we're not at risk. But in the SCP Foundation's universe, anything can be anomalous. Even humanity. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A young man was driving home from work late one rainy night when he spotted a woman in a white dress and a red sweater walking along the shoulder of the road. Concerned for her safety, he slowed down and rolled down the window so he could talk to her. When he asked where she was going, she said she was walking to her parents' house. The man pulled over and offered her a ride that she accepted. The woman gave him the address of her home, hopped in the back seat, and the man drove off. He sensed that she must have been cold from walking in the rain, so he cranked up the car's heater to help her dry off. Soon, she removed her heavy red sweater and placed it on the seat next to her. The man tried to make friendly conversation, asking if the woman had a job, what she was studying at school, where she'd been that day but she remained quiet, staring out the window. Until they drove past an old graveyard. The woman began pounding on the glass of the car as if she desperately wanted something. Unsure of what to do, the man pulled over. But before he could ask her what was happening, she had gotten out of the car. He exited the car to try and find her, but the woman was nowhere to be seen. She must have somehow ran off. Confused, the man got back in his car and drove away. He went on his way and didn't think of it again until the next day, when he noticed her sweater was still in the back of his car. He decided to go to the house she had originally given him the address for and give it back to her. He found the home without any trouble, but when he knocked on the door, the old woman who answered it was confused by his story. She told him that her daughter couldn't have possibly left her sweater in his car because she died in a car accident 30 years ago. The Vanishing Hitchhiker is a classic ghost story, with the details varying from place to place and storyteller to storyteller. In Chicago, she goes by Resurrection Mary, named after the graveyard she asks for rides to. In Okinawa, Japan, she's known as the Nightwalker of Nago, and she only appears to taxi drivers. In Kent, England, she's Suzanne, a bride killed in a car wreck on the way to her bachelorette party. In North Carolina, her name is Lydia, and in Hawaii, she's believed to be the goddess Pele in human form. But as far as our friends at the SCP Foundation are concerned, the vanishing hitchhiker's name is Mary Talish, also known as SCP-1337. On the 19th of May, 1952, college sophomore Mary Talish was abducted on her way to class in her hometown of Muncie, Indiana. When police found her body two weeks later, her eyes and heart had been torn from her body in a ritualistic fashion, and she had scrapes and bruises that suggested she had been beaten before her murder. Her killers were never caught, and her body was returned to her family for burial in Tomlinson Cemetery. Starting on the 19th of June that same year, someone matching Mary's description, a Caucasian woman with blonde hair standing 150 centimeters tall and wearing a red sweater, was spotted trying to fly down passing vehicles along Mayflower Road. Since then, every month on the 19th, Mary has been sighted along that stretch of road, and every month the same scenario plays out. Mary gives anyone who picks her up directions to her parents' house, then on the way she instructs the driver to stop at the graveyard where she was buried. She vanishes from the car, 
leaving her sweater. The driver of the car tries to return the sweater to her parents' house, only to be told that Mary Talish was dead. When the SCP Foundation was made aware of Mary Talish's pattern of haunting in the late 50s, they set up a system where agents would patrol Mayflower Road at hourly intervals with the intention of picking Mary up. Agents were sent on their own, in non-Foundation cars, and instructed to stick to the accepted script of the vanishing hitchhiker legend without attempting to engage Mary in further conversation. Mary's parents were also given E-Class agent status to keep them from speaking about the haunting and told that the Foundation was working on a way to set the spirit to rest. Early attempts to study the apparition were inconclusive. It proved impossible for the Foundation to relocate her or trigger her manifestation outside of the 19th of every month and attempts to analyze her sweater were fruitless, since if the sweater wasn't returned to the Talish family home, it would simply vanish from containment at or around sunset on the next 19th. For 20 years, SCP-1337 events continued to happen as normal. D-Class personnel under the instruction of the Foundation would pick Mary up, drive her past the cemetery, and return her sweater to her parents. It was business as usual, and in fact, it was one of the more sedate reoccurring apparitions the Foundation had to deal with. But, as you might have guessed, that peace wouldn't last forever. Enter Dr. Lawson, who, in 1972, was placed in charge of all resources regarding SCP-1337. Dr. Lawson was getting sick of all this phantom hitchhiker business, and while most of the Foundation was happy to keep this routine going, Lawson thought that the continual picking up and dropping off of Mary Talish and her red sweater was a waste of the Foundation's valuable time. After all, it was the early 70s. The price of oil was at an all-time high, so the expense of sending car after car up and down the same road for a solid day once a month just to pick up a ghost was more trouble than it was worth. So Lawson started developing a plan, one that he didn't go through the proper Foundation channels to approve. He reasoned that the reason Mary's ghost kept coming back was because she wanted something. Since always asked for a ride home, then it must mean she wanted to return back to her parents. So logic followed that if she had nothing or no one to go back to, then she'd stop appearing. On the 18th of June, 1973, Lawson went ahead with his plan without his superior's knowledge and ordered the execution of Mary Talish's parents, as well as the immediate demolition of their family home. According to his journals, Lawson had hoped that his attempt at decommissioning 1337 would significantly cut the Foundation's gas bills, freeing up valuable funds, at which point he'd surely be promoted in recognition of his brilliance. But that wasn't what happened. Lawson was demoted from team leader to junior staff, and only kept on 1337 detail out of the belief that, without a family to return to, Lawson would become the new focal point of the haunting should Mary Talish ever return. Though Lawson's actions weren't at all above board, even by SCP Foundation standards, they did seem to have worked. The 19th of June came and went without a single Mary sighting, and she wasn't seen the next month either. A full year went by without any sign of the Mayflower Road apparition. Satisfied with this turn of events, the Foundation made the decision to officially reclassify SCP-1337 from safe to safe decommissioned, and the gas money that was budgeted for the Mayflower Road Patrol was redirected to the SCP-682 Tank Acid Fund. But even though everything seemed to have been sorted out, Lawson wasn't entirely satisfied, and not just because of his demotion. Whether it was intuition or merely guilt-induced paranoia is unclear but he suspected that Mary was still out there somewhere. At first, he thought that she might show up on the anniversary of her parents' deaths, but then that date came and went, as did eight more anniversaries after it. Finally, on the 19th of June, 1983, Lawson decided he had to see for himself. Fitted with recording equipment, he drove alone in a non-Foundation standard car down that lonely stretch of road where so many before him had stopped to pick up that mysterious blonde woman with the red sweater. He had to prove to himself that she wouldn't show up, that he had really and truly gotten rid of her for good. It was about five o'clock in the evening when he reached Mayflower Road. At first, he didn't experience anything strange. He scanned the roadside, looking for the phantom hitchhiker walking along it, but there was nobody there. Dr. Lawson breathed a sigh of relief, he may have orchestrated the deaths of two innocent people, 
but at least it hadn't been for nothing. He turned on the recorder he brought with him and logged that nothing had happened. SCP-1337 had been permanently neutralized. As he approached the T-intersection and prepared to turn onto Marsh Avenue, he looked up to adjust his rearview mirror. To his horror, he found that he wasn't alone in the car. Someone was in the seat behind him. Someone with blonde hair and a red sweater. His last transmission consisted only of, Wait, who the hell are you? Before the recording abruptly stopped. Lawson's car was found soon after by Foundation agents. Lawson was dead in the front seat, bruised and bloody, with his eyes and heart ripped out in a ritualistic fashion, just the way Mary Talish had been found all the way back in 1952. It turns out that Mary hadn't been neutralized after all. She'd just been waiting for a chance to get revenge on the man who killed her family. And Mary didn't stop with Dr. Lawson. No longer does she appear walking along the road waiting for someone to offer her a ride before disappearing without incident. Now, should someone pass by without offering a ride, she will appear in their back seat before reenacting the method of her own death upon the driver. And her physical appearance has changed too. Whereas before she looked like the image of a pretty young woman before her tragedy, now recordings show that she appears with the wounds of her death present, her eyes gouged out in their sockets, and a massive hole in her chest where her heart should be. The same wounds she inflicts on her victims. The SCP Foundation has tried closing off and eventually destroying the road, but that has only resulted in Mary manifesting at other locations in and around Meansey. Foundation documents reveal that any back road in the city can potentially serve as host to a 1337 event, and all attempts to contain the apparition have failed. The only way someone who has seen Mary can avoid her wrath is by stopping to pick her up, at which point she will dematerialize before reappearing on another road. Mobile task forces have been unsuccessful, as Mary only appears to those driving alone, and all agents who have been sent on solo missions to apprehend her have resulted in the death of the agent. SCP-1337 was reinstated, this time as Euclid class. Currently, the Foundation's method of managing SCP-1337 is to dispatch a security team on the 19th of every month to monitor all the places where a potential sighting could take place. As soon as signs of a manifestation are identified, a remotely controlled vehicle containing a single D-Class is driven to the location. Once Mary appears in the car, the car is piloted to the empty lot where her home used to stand, and the remains of the D-Class are then disposed of. Like a lot of the stories that get passed down as urban legends, the story of SCP-1337 has a lesson that can be taken away from it. This SCP started off as an ordinary local haunting, no more deadly than Lydia, Suzanne, Resurrection Mary, or any of the countless other local versions of the Vanishing Hitchhiker story. But thanks to one rogue Foundation doctor and his desire to rush what he thought would be an efficient solution, the spirit not only became harder to control, but also much more violent and bloodthirsty than anyone was prepared to deal with. So if there's anything we can learn here, it's that no matter if you're a student, an office worker, or a researcher with the SCP Foundation, think twice about cutting corners. It might save you a little bit of time and money in the short term, but in the long term, the results could be fatal. If you have ever taken a trip to Sun Top Mountain in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, Washington State, then you may have come across an old wooden structure, the Sun Top Fire Lookout. Built in the early 1930s, the building was used by the U.S. Forest Service to keep watch for any fires in the nearby woodland. At one point, Sun Top Fire Lookout would have been manned 365 days a year, complete with a bed for staff who were stationed there on rotation. The single-story lookout house overlooks the scenic valleys of the White River and Huckleberry Creek, but you're not here for an informative tourist guide. You probably don't care about the frankly fascinating history of the lookout and how it was used as part of the aircraft warning service during World War II, watching for enemy planes. No, you're here because something much darker lurks inside the Suntop Fire Lookout. 
and even though it appears to be a simple one-story tall wooden structure, it certainly is not short on space. SCP-3333 refers to an anomaly that the Foundation discovered inside the Suntop Fire Lookout House. The building's interior is a single square room measuring 14 feet by 14 feet, with large windows on all four sides. When standing inside Suntop Fire Lookout, looking up at the wooden ceiling, one will immediately notice a trap door. No big deal, right? A lot of places have a ceiling entrance to a small crawl space. There's probably nothing behind that trap door, apart from a dusty old attic. There's a latch that maybe once had a padlock there, but not anymore. Opening the trap door will reveal a collapsible ladder. Should anyone be brave or indeed foolish enough to begin to climb, then they'll soon find themselves right back where they started, inside Suntop Fire Lookout. Or so it will seem. The thing about being in a place like the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest that surrounds Suntop Fire Lookout is that woodland areas are teeming with life. Not just plants and trees, but birds and other animals of the forest. You can never truly be alone in a setting like that. There is always life everywhere around you. So when you ascend the ladder and climb right back into the Sun Top Fire Lookout, that is the first most noticeable difference you will find. It may take a while at first, but the nagging absence of something unusually so abundant in a forest will eventually become obvious. It's quiet, far too quiet. No birdsong or the sound of distant calls from woodland critters, just silence all around. Anyone ascending the ladder will find themselves in a copy of Suntop Fire Lookout's interior, one story higher than the ground level of the small wooden building, with the stairs leading up to the front door getting taller each time to reach up to the higher and higher building. Now you know the SCP Foundation and the types of bizarre interdimensional anomalies that they're used to dealing with. Perhaps SCP-3333 is a mirror dimension, or a plane of existence where sound doesn't travel. It certainly seems to be identical to the Suntop Fire Lookout, save for the lack of any organic life outside. Of course, it's what you'll find living inside SCP-3333 that you may want to worry about. Climbing higher up the next ladder and through the next trapdoor every time with the same result. You appear at another copy of Suntop Fire Lookout, each one higher up than the last. What first seemed to be an innocuous, unassuming wooden building is now an endless ascension up into the heavens, towards the unknown in silence, without a shred of plant or animal life outside. As you climb, perhaps you start to think about how much higher these copies go. This might even be the biblical Jacob's Ladder connecting heaven and earth. That would be nice, wouldn't it? If you were gradually climbing your way up to paradise, it might make it worth the trip. But SCP-3333 is nothing that pleasant. You wouldn't be the first to attempt this long climb. When the SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-3333, a research detail set up an on-site base camp to examine this spatial anomaly. Their first exploration involved sending a member of D-Class personnel, designated D-4F-68A, up the ladder. His D number is a hexadecimal code that when translated to text reads O, oh, so we'll call him that for brevity's sake. During the first day's exploration, O was able to climb 184 iterations of SCP-3333, communicating with head researcher Dr. Williams below. On the second day, O could see a pair of figures standing motionless on a nearby ridge, but the pair could not be seen by Dr. Williams and the other researchers at the base camp. Both figures disappeared shortly after O spotted them with the camera he had been issued, and he felt uneasy, almost certain that he saw them point at him. The next day, at the 345th copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, O's behavior started to noticeably change. Previously, he had been anxious about the long climb, and hadn't questioned directions given to him by Dr. Williams. Now he seemed to speak more casually, resisting instructions, asking Williams to climb back down and even calling her Doc instead of Doctor. O also reported seeing writing on the walls, but there was no evidence of this on his camera. It appeared that something had started to affect him. It was when O reached level 527 that things seemed to change more dramatically. Rather than SCP-3333 continuing upwards, 
The copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout no longer had a trap door or ladder. They seemed to be arranged side by side in a grid-like pattern. Stepping out of the main doorway, O remarked on the lack of sunlight and a walkway that connected directly to the front door of the next iteration of SCP-3333. O complained about the lack of natural light and again requested to be allowed back down. Dr. Williams instructed O to use the flashlights he was provided, but they wouldn't activate and their spare batteries had vanished. O then noticed a sudden movement, and just then his microphone and camera feed went dead, almost as if someone had turned them off. It appeared that SCP-3333 had something else lurking up there. Dr. Williams oversaw the second expedition into SCP-3333. This time, members of Mobile Task Force Mod Zero, also known by the codename Characteristic Egg in Spaces, were sent up the ladder. Their ascent through the various copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout were not as eventful as O's, with no signs of mysterious figures or anxious feelings that O seemed to feel as he climbed. When they reached level 527, where the copies of the lookout stopped progressing upwards and spread out in a pattern instead, their lights and equipment all seemed to be in working order. However, as the MTF team split up, one by one they encountered some sort of anomaly, or an effect of SCP-3333 that caused each of them to vanish into the dark. Either that, or something took them. These MTF units reappeared confused, and Mod 5, the team's leader Graham Purcell, issued an order to retreat and the entire squad went back down the ladders for several days until they finally reached the base camp again. The members of Mod Zero were adamant they did not wish to climb SCP-3333 again, but Dr. Williams was beginning to understand more of the anomaly's effects. It appeared to cause abrupt changes to people's personalities, along with some sort of phenomenon that caused things to appear and disappear the higher one climbed. Assuming these were the result of a mimetic effect, Dr. Williams dispatched a counter-mimetic specialist for the next expedition. This specialist was a blind, deaf, and mute woman known as Annette, or the Null Walker, who communicated via a signaling system embedded in her hand, but was otherwise immune to any mimetic influences. Observed by Dr. Williams and Graham Purcell at base camp, Annette made her way to the top of SCP-3333, reporting that she was aware of someone watching her from outside the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout. On her body camera, a flicker of motion occurred, something looking through the windows that ducked out of frame when the camera passed in its direction. At the apex of SCP-3333, Annette kept her flashlight off, but reported that she could detect blood, following it to what she assumed was a body. Sounds of movement surrounded her, and as Annette switched on her flashlight, Williams and Purcell saw that it wasn't a body in front of her. Instead, it was a pile of rotting organs, decomposing muscles, and discarded bones. And among the pile was a metal dog tag that read, MTF Mod 5, Graham Purcell. The same man who was sitting next to Dr. Williams at base camp. Well, the same man on the outside, at least. The explanation for everything going on inside SCP-3333, all these strange occurrences and disappearances, finally came in a video sent from Dr. Williams' cell phone. In it, a panicked Williams, covered in blood, was fleeing from something at the top of the recursive stack of SCP-3333. There was no mimetic effect at the apex of the Sun Top Fire lookout copies. Nothing was causing the people that the Foundation sent up to act unlike themselves. They simply weren't themselves anymore. According to her frantic video, Dr. Williams had discovered the truth about what else was hiding within SCP-3333. With just the right amount of vagueness and intrigue, the research team had been drawn in. It was as if they'd been lured in by the lights of an anglerfish, realizing their grim fate only too late. The D-Class O, the MTF team, even Annette had been replaced. An unknown group of entities on the top level of SCP-3333 had been carefully observing them, waiting until they would not be seen to slip in and switch places. These entities had been creating imagined anomalous effects, like O seeing figures that weren't really there, as a way of luring more bodies further up the stack. They wanted the Foundation to keep sending expeditions into SCP-3333, 
to keep them coming back. The mass of organs, musculature, and bones that Annette had stumbled across, revealing the ruse, had once belonged to Graham Purcell, before he was replaced. You see, the entities residing in SCP-3333 weren't just copying people. They weren't possessing them or mind-controlling them, or even shape-shifting to steal a person's likeness. They were taking skin. These creatures hollowed out Graham, O, Annette, and the MTF team, pulling out their innards and crawling their way inside, filling these fleshy puppets and leaving their internal organs to rot. These hollowed out people became vessels for the entities of SCP-3333 to hide in. The whole thing had been a trap, intentionally exploiting human weaknesses, intrigue, and unanswered questions. You know what they say about curiosity, and these entities used it to bring more potential vessels to the top of SCP-3333. They pretended to be the people who they had replaced, mm. imitating them so the Foundation would send more personnel to explore the tower, increasing their supply of skins. Graham's dog tag had revealed the deception, and Dr. Williams had escaped up SCP-3333. The members of the research team that had already been replaced were hot on her tail, determined to catch and hollow her out too, and by the end of her video, they had succeeded. A month later though, a team delivering supplies realized what had happened and the trap door was sealed. Sun Top Fire Lookout was put under permanent guard but at least 50 personnel were killed or replaced by one of the entities. A new mobile task force, Lambda-1 Maxwell's Demons, was created to hunt down and neutralize any of the entities that had escaped SCP-3333. But it's still unknown how many left the tower and are still out there somewhere waiting to use someone's curiosity about the strange and unknown against them. An organization with as many secrets as the SCP Foundation requires the ability to dispose of material that could prove harmful to the facade of normalcy that the O5 Council desperately wishes to uphold. And because most of the high-ranking researchers are a bit too smart and practical to simply flush classified documents and unwanted objects down the toilet, that means the Foundation has to get rid of evidence thorough enough to guarantee that absolutely no trace of what needs to be disposed of survives. For this purpose, several waste disposal plants are used as front companies for the Foundation and function internally as a foolproof way to liquidate hazardous material and comprising information. But not all secrets are so easily forgotten with the push of a button and a rare few can prove too resilient to be burned away. This is the regrettable case of the anomalies contained within the site now designated SCP-2419, a place where the unfortunate consequence of amnestic experiments has led to the creation of hateful, immortal humanoids, fated to be sealed within the incinerators of the facility. These undead freaks are known as SCP-2419-A, and though they were made from human bodies, the consciousness that dwells within each instance is nothing short of pure evil. Every happy memory and associated positive emotion was extracted from the brains of SCP-2419-8 corpses prior to their attempted disposal in the incinerators. This was done in order to increase the effectiveness of standard issue foundation amnestics. But the cost of this minor breakthrough was that these bodies, all of which were once D-Class personnel, had effectively been stripped of all human qualities. Given the sorts of violent criminal backgrounds that earns an individual the designation of D-Class personnel, these former humans were the last people that should have been deprived of the love and joy in their hearts. And when the first of these psychopathic laughing men crawled out of one of SCP-2419's incinerators, the Foundation learned all too well what an uninhibited criminal mind looked like, driven only by rage and fury that inspired their most gruesome acts of exploitation and violence in life. Their pain has made them too hateful to succumb to the flames. They are the archetypal sinners of a burning hell that the Foundation's best intentions pave the road to. And when they break loose, all that hell breaks loose with them. 
but no place of the damned leaves its gates unguarded. Dante's Inferno posits that the ancient Greek mythological figure Minos, serpentine father of the Minotaur and judge of wicked souls, guards the pit of hell with stern vigilance. The Greeks themselves favored the image of Cerberus, a three-headed hound that served its lord Hades as a watchdog. For the ancient Egyptians, there was Amut, the devourer of the dead, who consumed the hearts of the unrighteous in the afterlife. While this sort of guardian beast is not officially on the Foundation's payroll, the concept turned out to be alive and well in the present day when SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, stood against the laughing men and gave them the fight of their tortured, unliving existence. It all began when the guards stationed at SCP-2419 began to hear banging from inside one of the incinerators. It seemed as though the SCP-2419-A instance on the other side was determined to breach containment, so Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Maz Hatters, were called in to stand with all weapons at the ready. But this was exactly what the instance wanted. As soon as the armed force had fully assembled, the laughing man inside ripped the door from its hinges. It proceeded to use it as a cover and run full speed towards the mobile task force, who opened fire immediately. SCP-2419-A were known to possess extremely fast regenerative abilities, so it would take a lot of punishment to slow this instance down. But this was no unthinking zombie, and the instance broke its charge the second it was in the midst of the mobile task force agents to twirl the door around like a trained martial artist. This not only sent the incoming bullets ricocheting everywhere, causing many of the Beta-7 operatives to be hit by their own friendly fire, it also allowed the instance to bludgeon several agents with sides of the door. As the remaining mobile task force members retreated to a less exposed vantage point, where they could employ heavy artillery, the instance used this moment of confusion to pitch the door backwards towards the incinerators in a boomerang trajectory. The force and spin of the door knocked two more incinerator doors off their hinges, and caused two other instances of SCP-2419-A to emerge. One, who was so thoroughly decomposed that it appeared to be more than a flaming skeleton, sprinted forth and threw handfuls of hot cinders at the Foundation agents. It used its still-burning body to ignite a few of the closest agents, laughing with sadistic glee as it did so. Seconds after the emergence of the two new instances, a grenade launcher was fired at the first escapee. The blast was enough to deal significant damage, but the instance was indifferent to its own pain. It pointed to the agent wielding the grenade launcher, and a moment later, the third instance was at the agent's throat, strangling him to death. It was starting to become clear to the mobile task force that this was no random containment breach. It was a coordinated escape attempt by three ruthless criminal masterminds, who in their time contained at the site SCP-2419 had probably decided there was some truth to the old adage that misery loves company. And indeed, these three D-Class were some of the best of the best when it came to being the worst of the worst. D-1576, formerly Police Lieutenant Campbell Farage, a riot cop with a serious taste for carnage. Whenever the streets of the city precinct he presided over turned violent, Farage always made sure that the violence didn't die down too quickly. His nasty penchant for bludgeoning suspects and citizens alike with his riot shield did wonders for the escape plan he had coordinated with his fellow laughing men. He was eventually tried and sent to a supermax after picking a fight with several other officers in the line of duty. A fight that resulted in a pair of rookie officers who opposed his violent methods being hospitalized with permanent comas. The skeleton was D-4483, Damien Lambert, a prolific arsonist who terrorized three counties while avoiding detection under the guise of being a sovereign citizen. If there was ever a person who wanted just to watch the world burn, it was Damien Lambert. He was caught in the process of setting fire to an elementary school and was thankfully apprehended before any of the kerosene he had poured through the halls ignited. When the truth about his previous history of pyromania came out, Lambert faced death row until the Foundation chose to recruit him as D-Class. Then there was D-2316, 
Arnold Roper, who was better known as the Illinois Strangler, responsible for over 50 deaths in two decades before he was arrested and detained. While he mostly used his bare hands to do the deed, Roper was fond of using metal chains and heavy-duty choke collars, usually worn by animals to perform his namesake act of violence. Roper wasn't just brutally strong, he was crafty too, and the trio of Laughing Men had him to thank for some of the finer points of the escape plan. The three now immortal D-Class also had one thing in common. Each of them had met the ends of their cruel and violent lives at the jaws and claws of SCP-682, and now that they had outmaneuvered and slaughtered Mobile Task Force Beta-7, their only collective goal was to get revenge on the monster that condemned them all to the fiery hell of the incinerator. The Laughing Men soon breached the limits of the SCP-2419 containment site and began making their way overland towards the facility where all of them had met their original fate. They knew they needed wheels to get there, so the instances made their way to the nearest gas station from the waste disposal plant they'd come from and made short work of the staff. Lambert stocked up on lighters, kerosene, and Duraflame, while Farage took the emergency shotgun that the cashier hadn't had time to fire. In her defense, it would have been difficult to accomplish much of anything with Roper's hands clasped around her throat. Once the trio of undead psychopaths had stocked up on weapons, they waited for a suitable vehicle to pull into the lot. And before long, there was. A family SUV, with a happy family inside, no less. Farage ordered Lambert to keep his fire-starting tendencies in check, as a gas station explosion was the last thing they needed right now. The former riot cop made his way out to the car and used the shotgun to threaten the family out of the car. Family road trips can be stressful, but rarely does one expect to be carjacked by a gang of the undead. Farage told the unlucky mortals that he wouldn't hurt them if they let himself and his two friends use their car. And true to his word, he didn't fire a single shot. The family were all added to Roper's list of victims instead. After that, the three men took to the wheel, and with only their hazy memories of pain and suffering to guide them, drove relentlessly towards the Foundation facility, where their enemy SCP-682 was contained. The three had made sure to leave no human alive at their original containment site, and would allow no witnesses who saw their anomalous corpse-like forms to survive. They couldn't afford to give the Foundation a heads up that the Reckoning was on its way in a family motor vehicle. Meanwhile, at the Laughing Man's intended destination, SCP-682 was having another perfectly routine day of painfully soaking in a tank of corrosive acid. This was par for the course for the reptile, and it found itself as eager as anyone else stuck in a rut to get a break from the repetitive mundanity of containment. Little did the human-hating monster know, it would soon get its wish. A few hours later, the facility was shocked to find that several fires had been lit at the fringes of the testing units. These were no freak accidents, but rather the work of Damien Lambert. The arsonist still had memories of all the times he wished he could just burn his jailer's buildings to the ground and had targeted the most vulnerable areas for combustion. The flames threatened the integrity of several areas of the facility, and multiple containment breaches were imminent if the blaze couldn't be kept under control. While any available agents with firefighting experience sought to minimize the damage, the researchers evacuated to safer parts of the building, bringing any sensitive documents and flammable items far away from the affected sections. This kind of pandemonium was exactly where Officer Farage thrived, and he soon entered the fray, causing enough commotion that Roper was able to slip deeper into the facility completely undetected. This turned out to be the perfect role for the Strangler, as he hadn't eluded the police for 20 years of his life just by being lucky. Farage and Lambert would both join up with him after they were finished having their fun. For now, his task was to locate the containment unit of SCP-682 and give the beast a taste of what the trio had in store. Along the way, he made sure to obtain some durable metal chains from a different containment unit. He likely released some kind of elder evil in the process, but Roper didn't care about the consequences. The bottom line was that he was always able to do his best work when he was armed. It wasn't long before he found the large chamber which housed his most hated foe, SCP-682. Roper laughed maniacally as he approached the creature floating in its acid tank, 
Remember me, lizard? The strangler said, sporting a wide grin. The monster simply growled back at Roper, wishing to tear him apart. Roper chuckled again and wrapped the iron chains around the vat. With all the considerable strength of his immortal muscles, the strangler pulled the chains taut and shattered 682's containment unit. The anomalous chain snared the creature's body, holding it in place. How about now? Roper taunted 682. He laughed, but the creature laughed back. No, said the reptile. I don't remember you, but you are disgusting. The monster lunged towards a nearby wall and burst through, dragging Roper along with it by his chain still wrapped around the creature's body. 682 twisted and turned, flinging Roper against every wall and obstacle in sight. But to its surprise, the stranger was regenerating, and his grip on the chains was unyielding. Back down the hall, Farage was still continuing his rampage when he ran into an unlikely adversary. Dr. Alto Clef stood between the laughing man and the other researchers, and as usual, the good doctor was packing heat. He told the other researchers to go on without him, while he contained the SCP-2419 instance on his own. A bold move, to be sure, but Dr. Clef had made the same mistake he was always making, by assuming that guns were the solution to this problem. Farage laughed off the bullets and slammed into Dr. Clef with enough force to leave a crater in the wall behind him. He followed up with a merciless barrage of punches, beating the armed researcher senseless, and only relenting for a moment to steal a few of his prized firearms. With a blow that would have taken the life of any normal man, Farage struck Dr. Clef once more and left him lying there a hair's length from death. Dr. Clef's anti-anomaly field may have protected him from reality warpers, but it did very little against being kicked repeatedly, very hard, in the face. Elsewhere, Lambert had made his way into the facility, setting more fires as he went. The arsonist's skeleton was a terrifying sight to all that beheld it, and when the guards realized that none of their weapons would have any effect, most of them started to run away from Lambert rather than towards him. All three laughing men would soon be upon 682, and then the fight of their afterlives could truly begin. Until that moment, Roper was buying his partners in hatred more time. The chains he had stolen were no ordinary metal, and with them he had managed to keep 682's jaws shut while he pounded away at its exposed ribs with his inhuman strength. Roper had killed more people than either of his former D-Class compatriots, but all that seemed to mean nothing in the face of this invincible reptile. The shame and powerlessness he had once felt as the creature had mauled him to death made his immortal heart beat with outrage. When he was alive, the Illinois stranger had always thought that his gift for murder made him better than the average person, a man among men. But this thing had made him feel weak in his last moments of humanity, and that sickening emotion of weakness was still sliding around in his soul with all of the other despair and malice. If his fate were to live forever as a dead man walking, then he would make damn sure that any humiliation he suffered would be paid back threefold. This soup of impotent fury bubbled within Roper as SCP-682 strength suddenly increased, shattering the weak link of the chains and sending the hapless strangler flying backwards. At that precise moment, Farage leaped out of a nearby hallway and unleashed Dr. Clef's arsenal on the reptile. This sustained fire irritated the creature, and it turned its focus towards the unliving dirty cop. It readied a charge only to be suddenly held fast by Roper, who had grabbed its tail. Farage fired until there was no more ammo, then pistol whipped the creature in both of its eye sockets. SCP-682 thrashed and struggled, so the men began to circle the reptile and alternate delivering formidable body blows. They took far more damage than they could dish out with their bare hands, but the regeneration that their preternatural hatred granted them meant that both instances could theoretically keep this up all day. Roper grabbed a broken length of the anomalous chain, while Farage picked up a metal table to use as a makeshift riot shield. The beatdown continued as 682's eyes regenerated, along with several new sensory organs to give it a full 360-degree view of the pitched brawl that was taking place. A fiery explosion blew open a nearby wall, and in walked Lambert, still skeletal and laughing as uproariously as ever. He threw a Molotov cocktail at 682's back, causing the creature to ignite immediately. The reptile roared in sudden agony. 
Farage, Lambert, Roper regrouped at the creature's flank and pushed together until they forced it back through the hole where the arsonist had entered from. They were now all together in the inferno, the three laughing men who refused to die, and the indestructible monster that made them into what they were. Roper quickly knotted the chains and wrapped them around one of the creature's claws, securing the other end around his waist. Like a trained boxer, he bobbed and weaved, pummeling the beast with all he had. Any step back from SCP-682 was met with the immortal man shifting his entire body weight to pull the creature's leg out from under it. Farage wedged his shield into the creature's open jaw, widening it to an uncomfortable degree and temporarily limiting 682's bite force. He took out the shotgun that he had stolen from the gas station and blasted it down the reptile's gullet. When that plan had run its course, he started clubbing 682 about its neck and head with the butt of the shotgun. Lambert simply continued to douse the arena with more flammable material, especially himself and the creature. He climbed onto 682's back with his burning bones and hammered away at its defenses with literal fists of fire. The arsonist was incapable of articulate speech due to the damage to his body prior to his death, but if he could speak, he would probably be celebrating the fact that he had become what he had always wanted to be. Damien Lambert was no mere pretender with a fetish for fire. He was fire itself. A brightly burning god of destruction that left no inch of the world unburnt and no molecule of oxygen unconsumed. His mother and father would be proud of him as they waited in hell for the sun who would never arrive. The sun who would make the planet they left behind into a true hell where he would reign supreme. That is, until SCP-682 stole that dream out from under him. With a flash of blue and green from deep within, 682 began to burn with a never-before-seen chemical reaction, an impossible event that could only be described as anti-fire. The turquoise anti-flames devoured the orange and yellow ones, leaving Lambert in a state of panic, which was soon shared by his fellow laughing men. The three former D-classes had gotten so used to the torments of the incinerator that the idea that anything could be more painful had never occurred to them. And yet, here it was, the Anti-Fire, which devoured all flames and directly inflicted unimaginable suffering to the trio of instances. Every particle of their still regenerating bodies felt as if it were ice cold and melting into nothingness at the same time. Numbed and broken all over again, the laughing men were consumed all over by the anti-flames and fell into a state of suspended animation. With the Foundation finally getting everything back under control 24 hours later, SCP-682 was contained in a new acidic chamber. There were some new ordinances from all present and surviving researchers about exposing it to fire, as the anti-flames it produced were considered too hazardous to ever exist within the facility again. As for the three laughing men who had escaped from SCP-2419, they were returned to their containment units inside of the incinerators and never exhibited signs of aggression or escape attempts ever again. A psychological profile of Farage, Lambert, and Roper that all of them could still feel the sting of the burns left by 682's anti-fire to this day, and that not even exposure to natural heat and fire could ever reduce that pain. Russell's back was pressed against the wall, his shuddering hands gripping the fire axe. The low emergency lighting filling the corridor indicated the lockdown was still in effect, although that was simultaneously a blessing and a curse. Sure, it meant that thing couldn't get out, hopefully, but it also meant that Russell was stuck in the wing of the facility with it. He had no idea if anyone else was left. He hadn't seen what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him, or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. There was no way of knowing for sure. It had all started so simply, so innocently, and with such noble intentions. If he had known it would lead to all this madness, Russell would have never put his name down on the request form. The SCP Foundation had been working on a way to neutralize or cure SCP-610 for what felt like forever. To one team of scientists, the infamously so-called flesh that hates was a fascinating organism. It was a highly contagious sarcic skin disease, isolated entirely within the small area of Siberia. That on its own wasn't enough to pique the interest of the research team led by Dr. Carpenter, including his hand-picked star researchers Russell and David, along with their assistant Clennon and Dr. Botten. 
an expert on infectious diseases who had recently joined their efforts to provide his specialist knowledge. What did captivate all of them, however, was what SCP-610 did when it infected a human being. The disease would trigger aggressive and uncontrollable mutations within its infected and could virtually rewrite their entire physiology in a heartbeat. The flesh that hates was capable of transforming a person's body into a horrifying fleshy mass of limbs and matter that barely resembled a human being anymore. And in addition, the infected individuals would retain some level of awareness, attacking any uninfected person with extreme hostility. There had long been chatter amongst some other research teams studying SCP-610 about devising a way to weaponize the disease. If they could somehow create a variant that didn't turn people into monsters, or at least cause the fleshy abominations to die shortly after mutation, then the Foundation or another interested party could deploy the flesh that hates as a biological weapon. Dr. Carpenter had long abhorred the idea, instead searching for a way to completely reverse the effects of an SCP-610 infection. It may have been idealistic, perhaps even naive by some standards, but the rest of his team was behind him in the pursuit of that noble goal, although not one of them knew it would soon cost them their lives. Hitting speed bump after speed bump in their research, the team were beginning to lose hope. Researcher David was the most outspoken in how tired he was of seeing the same results, yelling in frustration that the flesh could not be cured by conventional means. However, it was that outburst that gave Russell the idea. They had tried treating SCP-610 like a common virus, as if it was any other form of disease, largely thanks to Dr. Botton's input. And granted, that approach had taught them a lot about the flesh's ability to contaminate a subject from a single cell. But this infection was anomalous through and through. Could the solution to eradicating it for good lie not in a medical cure, but in another SCP? Russell brought this hypothesis to the rest of the research team, and each of them had suggestions for other anomalies they could potentially use to cure a subject of the flesh that hates. We could get SCP-049 to take a look at the infected patient, Clennon suggested. Oh, it might work, Carpenter mused. Although even if he cures someone, he might also kill them. He has his whole deal about ridding the world of the pestilence could prove to be a problem. Uh, there's always 682, David said dryly. Have the reptile eat up all the SCP-610 infectees and voila, problem solved. Oh, real helpful, David, researcher Russell retorted. And what are we going to do when SCP-682 adapts to the flesh? You really want an infected immortal lizard on the loose? Gentlemen, please. Dr. Botton spoke up. We're forgetting one obvious option. I propose we submit a joint formal request to use SCP-914 for this experiment. Unanimously, the group all agreed that this was the best course of action. SCP-914, or the Clockworks, was a giant machine with two booths marked Input and Output. Although the Foundation still couldn't fully comprehend exactly how SCP-914 seemed to take any object placed within it and disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy the item depending on its current setting. There was one issue, however. A prior failed experiment wherein a D-Class was placed in SCP-914 had led to some pretty disastrous consequences. As a result, ever since, no organic matter was to be placed within the clockworks, a rule that the team's experiment with the flesh would breach. Still, they pressed on, each of the five researchers signing their request to utilize SCP-914 before it was submitted to the Foundation higher-ups. Within hours, the request was denied. But the team was determined that SCP-914 could be the key to solving the Foundation's long-standing issue with SCP-610. Dr. Carpenter repealed the decision, urging the higher-ups to reconsider. He argued that this flouting of the no organic matter rule was necessary to potentially rid the world of the flesh that hates. After a few days of consideration, the request was finally, fatefully, granted. The team went to work immediately, requisitioning two test subjects, both of which had suffered SCP-610 infections and were horribly mutated. The pair of them were deemed a potential hazard to every member of Foundation staff on site, 
and as a result, the entire wing of the facility where the clockworks was housed had to be evacuated for safety. Dressed in biohazard suits to protect themselves, the researchers used an electric cattle prod to coax the first flesh specimen into the input chamber of SCP-914. This was the test run. They wanted to see if the clockworks would actually be able to affect those infected with SCP-610 at all. Plus, they needed a failsafe just in case something went wrong, and luckily the machine had just the thing. Russell asked Clement to set the clockworks to rough, and with a click and whir of its numerous gears and gyros, SCP-914 came to life. Instantly, the infected test subject was completely obliterated. The setting had reduced it to atoms, disintegrating it on such a microscopic level that there was nothing left in the output chamber. The second infected creature seemed to bristle with anger, but didn't attack or become aggressive, as it too was prodded towards the clockworks. Next, perhaps out of fear that their theory might be wrong, the team agreed to set SCP-914 to its one-to-one -one setting. Sure enough, the machine recreated another instance of a specimen infected with the flesh that hates, replacing the previous one. We all know we're stalling, researcher David piped up. Let's do what we came here for. Set the clockworks to course. Nervously receding a nod from Dr. Carpenter, Clennon stepped forward to switch the dial on SCP-914 to the course setting. This was the primary reason the team had all agreed to use the machine on a flesh specimen. This setting could disassemble any item placed in the input booth, separating it into its base components. Botten had suggested the use of SCP-914 based on the theory that, if it worked correctly, the clockworks could extract the flesh that hates from its infected host, rendering them free of the disease. The machine made a colossal amount of noise as Clennon hurried back to a safe distance with the others, but as it was powering up, seconds from activating, Dr. Carpenter noticed something. The color drained from his face as he saw it. None of the others had noticed from a distance that the dial hadn't been set to course. Instead, it pointed to very fine, the highest refinement setting 914 had. What the hell have you done? Carpenter yelled at Clennon before the machine suddenly activated. What stepped free from the output booth stunned the researcher. It was a man, a seemingly ordinary human, who had presumably been infected by SCP-610 some time ago. He stepped nervously out of the machine, looking confused for a moment as a pair of Foundation security guards cautiously approached him. We did it, Russell said in awe. Suddenly, fleshy tendrils burst forth from the man's arms, latching on to the approaching guards. They screamed in agony, their bodies melting, become a bloody, misshapen mass that stayed attached to the humanoid creature at the center. It was like they became a part of it, the guards' arms and legs forming additional limbs as their forms were reconstituted and repurposed as part of a monster that was now crawling on its six legs towards the research team. In a blind panic, the group scrambled for the entrance, the head of the infected man splitting open down the middle, opening up into a wide, snapping pair of jaws. Panting hard as he ran, his breath fogging up the clear faceplate of the biohazard suit, Russell ran through the door, hearing someone close behind. He stopped for a moment, looking back to see the creature on the other side of the door starting to spill through the doorframe like a liquid. Running faster around a corner, Russell came to another halt in the common area. A third security guard following just before a thick steel security door came slamming down, sealing the creature on the other side. The other door didn't hold it! What good is that going to do? Researcher David yelled. More to the point, Dr. Carpenter said, turning and marching towards Clennon. He launched a furious punch at the assistant, knocking him to the floor. Why did you set 914 to very fine, Clennon? The enraged doctor shouted. You're the one who unleashed that abomination, you maniac! What? Clennon replied, fearfully trembling. I, I didn't, I swear I didn't. It said course. I'm sure of it. You expect us to believe that was a mistake? Gentlemen, we need to focus on the situation at hand, the security officer interjected. Regardless of who's responsible, we need to inform the Foundation higher-ups. There's an emergency lockdown, Russell replied. It would have triggered the moment the SCP-610 specimen got free. You've trapped us with a monster, Clennon, Dr. Carpenter spat. Hold on, researcher David spoke up. Wasn't it Botten's idea to use 914 in the first place? The common area fell silent as everyone turned to look at Dr. Botten. Did you plan for this, Doc? David pushed. Botten chuckled. Need I remind you, my friends, that we all agreed to use the clockworks, did we not? All of our names are on the request, he answered. Besides, accusing me, David, that's rather rich coming from you. What's that supposed to mean? The researcher fired back. 
Beckoning his finger, Botan encouraged the rest of the team to follow him across the common area to where a row of lockers stood, each door bearing one of their names. He gestured to the one labeled David. Go on, Botan added. Shooting him a dirty look, David barged past the disease expert and opened his locker. Not one among the group expected what would fall out. It was an old leather-bound book, symbols carved into the front cover. Instantly, thanks to the work studying SCP-610, the researchers all knew a text on sarcasm when they saw one. It had been long known that the flesh that hates was often described in texts revered by sarcic cults, who worshipped death, decay, and disease. What the hell, David? Russell exclaimed, picking up the book and examining it in disbelief. You're a sarcist? Carpenter asked, the fury in his voice already elevating. No, I'm not! Researcher David protested. I I've never seen that before! It was in your locker, the doctor yelled. You're one of those cannibal cultists! This was your plan! To refine the flesh for your twisted, death-worshipping religion! It certainly seems that way, Botten interjected. After all, Researcher David did seem frustrated at our earlier results. Impatient, even. <laughs> you! David pointed at the doctor. You planted this in my locker! You're here a sarcist, Clennon repeated in a nervous stammer. You made me turn the dial to very fine, you made that thing appear, you made me your accomplice! Anger tears streamed down his face, Clennon's hand reached for the security officer's gun and went to draw it, planning to shoot David on the spot. But as he went to pull the weapon from the guard's holster, it wouldn't budge. It was then that Assistant Clennon stared in horror at his hand. His fingers had fused to the guard's leg. The officer gave a twisted grin as his torso burst open, tendrils of flesh latching onto Clennon and assimilating him. Just like it had done before, the flesh creature broke down its victim's body, making it a new part of itself, a grotesque mass of limbs and bloody matter, littered with the discarded faces of those it had infected. The research team looked at it terrified, their stomachs turning, disgusted at the growing, growling abomination of bodies fused to one another. Oh, you're beautiful. Russell heard a voice whisper behind him. He turned to see Botton, looking at the SCP-610 creature and smiling. Researcher David was the closest, and the creature lunged at him, pulling his leg out from under him. Screaming in fear, the researcher fell onto the ground and was dragged towards the flesh. It pulled him in, his body stretching, skin tearing and bones snapping as he became part of it. A new set of limbs added to the monster. Dr. Carpenter went to try and pull him free, but it was already too late. But he stepped back, knowing that if he touched it, he would be infected too. The sound of running caught Russell's attention, and he spotted Botten making a break for it. Grabbing Dr. Carpenter by the sleeve, the researcher pulled him in the same direction, partly running away from the flesh as it assimilated David, and partly chasing the sarcic saboteur. The pair of them quickly caught up to Botten, leaning over himself and panting breathlessly. Thank God you two made it, he wheezed after the run. I can't believe David could do this to unleash this nightmare upon us. Russell thought to snap at him, to scream how dare he keep lying, but Botten's back was to him now. He'd never get a better chance. There was a cabinet on the corridor wall containing a fire axe for emergencies. As carefully and quietly as he could, Russell fished the axe out of its case whilst Botten and Carpenter were looking away. We should get the Foundation to lift the lockdown, Botten was saying. They need to let us out and then- oh! Oh! He let out a blood-curdling scream mid-sentence as the axe blade wounded him. Russell pulled it back, standing over the doctor as he fell to the floor in agony. Russell, have you lost your mind? Carpenter exclaimed. No, doctor. He's the cultist. I have no idea how he tricked Clennon, but that flesh creature exists because of him, the researcher answered. From the floor, unable to move thanks to his injury, Dr. Botten began to laugh. It took me years to infiltrate the Foundation. So much time waiting to gain access to that blessed flesh, he gloated. And now you've helped me to refine it, to create its ultimate form. You want to kill me? Go ahead, Russell. Oh, my life doesn't matter. For once that creature is free, it will bring about a new age of flesh, and Grand Carcist Iron will reward me for the role I played in unleashing it. David was right, Carpenter realized. Botten, you, you've planted that book on him to throw us off. Doctor, we need to think of something, researcher Russell interjected, axe still in hand. Nobody knows more about the flesh that hates than us. There must be a way to kill that thing. Otherwise, if it gets out of this lockdown, it could spread to everyone in the Foundation. What about fire? That's been effective against 610 infectees before, right? Yes, yes, but the doctor desperately tried to think. This new being we've created, he created. 
Russell argued, looking at the grimacing, wounded Botten. We cannot deny the role we've all played in this researcher, Carpenter argued, and we have no idea if it possesses the same weaknesses as the flesh before its refinement. But we have to try, sir, the researcher protested. Of course, I agree. The sickening sound of a slithering, slick mass was rapidly approaching. Still laying on the floor in pain, Dr. Botten had been dragged to the middle of a junction, with Carpenter and Russell hiding around either corner. Suddenly, Botten started hollering as the flesh came into view, practically calling it to him. Oh, look at you! He exclaimed. You're better than I could have ever hoped for! Looking down at him with the faces it had collected, the creature stabbed one of its disgusting appendages through Botten, drawing its body into its growing form. I am honored to give my life so that the age of flesh may begin, the doctor said weakly, through the pain as he was infected. From around the corner, Carpenter had taken the sarcic text and set its pages on fire with a cigarette lighter. Turning to the creature, he hurled the mass of burning paper at it, hoping it would be enough fire to spread to the flesh while it was assimilating Botten, who they had left there as bait. The fiery book collided with the monstrosity. As Russell peeked around the corner, he saw the flesh retreating from the flames, Botten's body now added to it. For a moment, it seemed like the creature was afraid of the fire, but slowly it drew nearer and nearer to the book. With ease, it stamped down the flames with Botten's leg, dousing the fire and suffering no damage to it at all. Gripping the axe in his hands, Russell went to charge at the creature, only to feel something push him back. Dr. Carpenter had stopped him. Run! He yelled. Instantly, Russell turned and raced down the corridor, the sound of fleshy tentacles whipping through the air. He dared not look back, just in case the monster was right behind him. Eventually, he reached another corner and slammed his back against it, hands shuddering as he held on to the fire axe. He had no idea what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him, or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. Russell! Came a hushed voice from around the corner, one the researcher recognized. He turned to see Dr. Carpenter approaching him, sneaking like he was trying to avoid being heard. I think I managed to give it the slip, the doctor whispered. For a second, Russell backed up, his hands tightening around the axe handle. This might have looked like Dr. Carpenter, but was it? Are you really you, doctor? He asked. Of course I am! Carpenter replied. You don't think that... I'm not that monstrosity! Russell raised the axe defensively, only to notice the sadness in the doctor's face. Unable to bring himself to swing, even to find out, the researcher lowered his weapon. Carpenter looked grateful. Come on, let's get them to lift this lockdown, he said. I'm sure an MTF can step in and take care of our mistake. As the pair of them cautiously made their way towards one of the locked doors, Dr. Carpenter reached out a hand to place it on Russell's shoulder. Ask anyone that has been through it and they'll all tell you the same. That moving home is maybe one of the most stressful things that a normal person can ever experience. It's a logistical nightmare right from the start. The moment you talk to a realtor about being interested in selling your current house and buying another, everything goes downhill from there. After that moment, an avalanche of things comes hurtling towards you. Finding a place you like, making an offer, letting people look around your house, waiting for them to make a counteroffer, exchanging contracts, and that's before you even have thought about packing. And as Milo had learned, doing all of that on your own only makes the stress of moving feel all the more potent. But he had finally made it. After a constant back and forth with his realtor, the time had come for him to pack up all of his worldly possessions and relocate to a brand new place to call home. He had felt it was long overdue for him to get a change of scenery, and luckily just the right place had come onto the market to answer that call. It was a pretty big house, bigger than Milo's previous home, but considerably cheaper. In fact, he thought it had been significantly undervalued. The house had an almost Victorian-era feel to it, all beautifully carved and varnished woodwork and creaky old floorboards, but in more of an elegant, refined sort of way, rather than a creepier one. That's not to say Milo's new place wasn't without its more unsettling elements. Aside from being big, spacious, and easy to imagine as being haunted, the creepiest thing about the house, aside from its frighteningly low price, was the story of what happened to the previous owners. Obviously, you know that legally we have to disclose whether or not anyone died on this property, the realtor had explained, wearing a forced grin as she showed Milo around the house. Hearing that sentence, he could feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Someone died here? He asked in disbelief. No, 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 of course not, sir. 
The realtor instantly walked back her statement, less in an effort to ease her client's nerves, but more to ensure that she still closed the deal and earned her commission bonus. Then why the hell would you start a sentence like that? Milo asked. We just have to give full disclosure, but I assure you, the previous residents didn't die on the grounds of this house. She gave that fake smile again. It was pretty ineffectual at reassuring him. So, what happened to the last owner? Well, it's a bit of a mystery, to be honest. A local legend, if you like. But hey, that gives the place more flavor, hearing some spooky history, right? Think of what a conversation starter that will be. The realtor ended her sentence with a forced, snorting laugh, but reined it back in when she realized Milo wasn't laughing with her. Ah, as far as I know, there used to be an older couple living here, the Shaws. They were apparently very quiet, reclusive, kept to themselves a lot, I'm sure you know the type. Milo couldn't help but notice she shot him a look as she said that part, as if she was silently passing judgment on the fact he was planning on moving in alone. But they used to spend a lot of time tending the garden out front, so their neighbors would see them pretty frequently, which meant they were all okay and no one had any bad mishaps in the house. You know how old folks can be, such a worry when they get to that age. Yeah, totally. Milo interjected, aware the realtor was stalling. He repeated, So, what actually happened to them? Well, that's the thing, she shrugged. Nobody knows the full story. One day, the neighbors across the street noticed they hadn't seen Mr. and Mrs. Shaw for quite a while, so naturally they came on over here to see if they were in, and the last thing they wanted was to assume everything was hunky-dory here. I mean, hey, better safe than sorry, right? But once they got inside, they couldn't find either of them. Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were just gone, vanished without a trace. Most people on the street thought they had just sold the place, kept it quiet and moved away, retired to somewhere nice and exotic. Oh, well, that sounds nice, I suppose. Milo replied, relieved to hear that there hadn't been any brutal unsolved murders in the house, and that it most likely wasn't haunted. That's just what the neighbors think anyway, the realtor continued. Of course, they hadn't sold the house, they'd just left it. When my firm came in to repossess the place, it had all their belongings in it. Some might even still be laying around here. Uh, anyway, did you want to have a look at that contract? Well, strictly speaking, Milo was the only human living in his new house. He was never fully alone. He had arrived with his two closest friends, a pair of pets he had adopted while living in his old house. One was a hamster by the name of Donut, named after his round little body, and the golden brown shade of his fur had reminded Milo of the glazed sugary baked treat. The other was Pixel, a bearded dragon with a pattern on his scales that resembled some kind of mosaic art. The first order of business, Milo had decided, was before even unpacking. He needed to make sure his scaly and furry friends each had a suitable place to stay and that he got them fed. Little did he realize there was something else living in the house with them. Something that was far bigger and was getting much hungrier than either of his pets would. Looking around the house, Milo stumbled across a few boxes that he hadn't brought with him. Like the realtor had said, the Shahs still had some of their possessions left lying around the place. Most of it was useless to Milo. Old man's clothes, or a set of knitting needles and rolls of colorful thread, it was those particular clues that seemed to imply Mrs. Shaw had a lot of free time on her hands, and maybe took up knitting as a hobby during retirement. Of course, the bigger clue was the huge handmade blanket that Milo found draped over some of the remaining boxes in the attic. He wasn't exactly well versed in knitwear, but he could appreciate the craft behind this soft blanket. It clearly had a lot of time and effort put into making it, painstakingly knitting each and every individual thread, looping it around a pair of steel needles and eventually, after hours of wearing out shaking, bony fingers, produce something that actually looked quite nice. Even though the idea of sitting and knitting a blanket might have been one of the most boring uses of time Milo could imagine, he still had to admit he was surprised that the Shahs had left this particular piece of bedding behind. It seemed like it would be pretty comfy to sleep under, and might help keep a person warm at night now that the colder seasons were approaching. What's more was that the blanket was clean, almost like it had been freshly washed. There was no old person smell on it, no dirt or discoloration, not a stain and it hadn't even accumulated any dust in its fibers. In fact, he noticed that there was hardly any dust at all up in the attic, despite the house being empty for so long. He assumed the realtors had hired someone as a caretaker while they found a buyer for the place, 
and they had kept the place clean. After all, what other conclusion could they have possibly drawn? It's not as if something had eaten all the dust. That would be absurd. He'd have a sort through of the Shah's leftovers later, maybe sell some of it off at a local yard sale or give it to a thrift store. But that blanket might come in handy when it started snowing, so Milo had half a mind to keep it. Now, part of what makes moving home such a stressful life experience isn't just all the logistical and administrative parts of the process. It's only made worse by the fact that it takes forever to move into a new house fully. That's the part everyone always forgets about. The months after a move, when you're forced to live amongst towers of cardboard boxes, all your worldly possessions buried deep within them, and you can never remember which crate anything is in when you urgently need it. So realizing it would take him much longer to unpack all of his things, Milo set about making sure he had everything that Donut and Pixel would need already to hand. The latter of his two pets, the bearded dragon, usually spent most of his days in a spacious glass tank. Milo didn't love the idea of keeping either of his two best buds so confined, but Pixel never went very far anyway, content to lay under a heat lamp almost perfectly still for most of the day. Donut, on the other hand, was much more of a free spirit. The tiny brown hamster physically could not stay still, and most days seemed to be filled with more energy than Milo was. As a result, he let the little guy roll about inside a little plastic ball all day long, until his little hamster feet gave out. And now, Donut had much more space to zip around inside his ball, so while he entertained himself, Milo could focus on what needed fixing, cleaning, and generally improving around the house. It didn't take him long to realize, however, that the realtors had pulled a bit of a fast one on him. Despite the absolute steal of a price that Milo had been offered, it quickly became clear that the unknown fate of the previous residence wasn't the only detail about the house that had been conveniently kept hidden. The place was in dire need of repair, with a lot of the old woodwork rapidly rotting away. If left unchecked, parts of the house could collapse and come apart at the seams. To make matters worse, the boiler was an ancient iron monstrosity that was barely able to produce warm water, which would quickly become an even bigger problem when the weather started to get colder. Then, to top off the trifecta of unforeseen issues and teething problems with his new place, Milo couldn't sleep. It was to be expected. After all, the house was old, worn out, and had definitely seen better days. There were bound to be a few noises, the odd creak coming from upstairs when Milo and his two pets were all downstairs, the tapping of branches against windows blowing in the wind outside. But for some reason, every audible disturbance that emanated from some hidden corner of the building only seemed to get a thousand times louder when the sun went down. At nighttime, every squeaky floorboard or random noise of the house settling was nearly deafening, enough to pull Milo right out of what little restless sleep he was getting. The worst part about it was, though he couldn't help it, it made him feel unwelcome as if Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were angered that he had moved in. In the dark, it was hard not to picture every sound as one or both of the old couple creeping through the corridors, coming to reclaim their home and remove Milo from the premises. One night, the noises started invading what little sleep Milo did manage to get, spilling into his dream and causing them to devolve into unsettling nightmares. There was an old photograph in a frame that he had come across in the personal effects left behind by the Shaws, showing the pair of them staring disapprovingly out of the image at him. Now, thanks to the creaking wooden structure of the house and the sounds it made at night, Milo was seeing the old couple in every bad dream he had. Both their faces were locked in those same still, frozen expressions of contempt as they tried to exercise him like an interloper on their property. That was the final nail in the coffin that made Milo realize he needed to look at other options. Surely there had to be some way to induce a deep enough sleep so that the sounds the house was making weren't keeping him up or incepting nightmares anymore. He called the local doctor, arranging a consultation for later that day. As he hung up the phone, something nudged against his foot. It was Donut, having rolled through the maze of cardboard boxes still filling the house. Milo took one look at the little brown furred hamster than the crates that still littered the place. Grabbing the leftover items that the Shahs had forgotten to take with them before they vanished, Milo moved those boxes out into the shed. He knew he was probably reaching, that it was hard likely to make even the slightest difference to his sleeping, but maybe keeping their stuff away from him would keep the old couple out of his head. The only thing he kept in the house was the blanket, 
There was no use letting it go to waste, especially knowing that the boiler was on the blink and it would be cold soon. He rolled it up and left it on his bed, leaving his more mobile pet in the same room before heading out to see the doctor. When Milo got back, a bottle of prescription sleeping pills in his pocket, he couldn't help but notice his room seemed different. The blanket looked like it had fallen off the bed and onto the floor for one. But more worryingly, Donut's plastic travel ball had been split open, laying in pieces on the ground, with its furry little occupant nowhere to be seen. Over the next few hours, Milo searched every corner of the house, calling out to his hamster, trying to lure it back with more morsels of food. But Donut didn't seem to be anywhere. He wasn't even underneath the knitted blanket. Still, there was no sign. As worry set in, Milo hurriedly checked Pixel's cage to see if he was gone too, but the lizard was relaxing, as lethargic as ever, completely unfazed by what was going on. It certainly seemed that when it rained, it really poured in this new house. Just as he was searching for his missing hamster, Milo heard a new, horrible sound echo through the corridors. This one wasn't so much a scary noise, even if it did make him jump, but it was more the inconvenience that came with it. Finally, giving out after God knows how many years it had been installed for, the house's boiler burst. Spending the afternoon into the evening failing to track down one of his missing pets and stopping the huge iron cast boiler from flooding the basement wasn't exactly what Milo had in mind for fun activities to do when he got home. Going to bed frustrated made it as hard to sleep as all the nightly cacophony of creaking floorboards and branches raking against the windows. He tapped out two of the pills the doctor had prescribed him, knocking them back with a sharp motion of his head and a swig of cold water before laying back in bed. As night had fallen, the temperature also had plummeted too, and not having a boiler to heat his room meant that Milo couldn't stop himself from shivering in the cold, his breath forming clouds in front of his face. He reached for the knitted blanket and threw it over himself, curling up underneath it to try and provide an extra layer of warmth to protect himself from the gnawing cold. The pills did as they were meant to, helping Milo to quickly sleep into a much deeper sleep than he had experienced in a while. Although it didn't seem to help the nightmares, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw came back again. This time they had Milo's arms and legs tied up. With their matching disapproving faces, the elderly couple threw something over their helpless victim and tried to smother him to death. For a dream, it felt so intense, so real. Milo could feel a heavy weight on top of his body as he slept. In fact, it felt like it was all around him, engulfing and crushing the life out of him from all sides. But it was the feeling of something wet against his arm, the sensation of liquid against his skin, and the numbness where his hands should be were what finally pulled him out of the dream and into the nightmare. Through the dark and his cloudy vision, Milo could see a wide, gaping maw filled with teeth. The feeling of being crushed was still surrounding him, and despite kicking his legs and trying to free himself from confinement, it didn't stop squeezing him tighter. His panic was already making it harder to catch his breath, but now he could barely fill his lungs enough to scream for help. Not that anyone was around to hear him, but it was the sight of his arm that chilled Milo's blood. It wasn't there anymore. Part of it just above the elbow was just gone. His hand, fingers, every internal bone and muscle had been reduced to a bloody mess, a slurry of red melting and coming apart. It was runny, little more than a liquid resembling the consistency of sand when it's underwater and becomes sludge. Most of his flesh was liquefied, going further up his arm, and as the blanket pulled its prey into its mouth until Milo was no more, not a trace of him left, just like the previous owners. Little did Milo or the Shaws and Donut before him know, but he'd been the victim of a creature that was part of a rather unique species. While they will often vary in size, shape, pattern, and other aspects of their appearance, SCP-799 always seem to be ordinary items of knitted bedwear, at least at first. They retain heat like a normal blanket would, and are soft to the touch, and for the most part, don't seem directly harmful. And usually, they aren't. SCP-799s are incapable of much movement, instead laying still a lot of time, not unlike a certain bearded dragon that just lost its owner. They also don't seem to require much in the way of food, extracting what little nutrition they do need by drawing in household dust. A lot of the organic matter and dust is comprised of dead and discarded human hair and skin cells, so this makes sense. This feeding is all done through filtered mouths in the fibers. However, this changes if an SCP-799 blanket 
is forced to go on a long time without food. While they possess this biological trait themselves, SCP-799 don't seem to regard cold-blooded animals to be the source of food. In fact, they don't even seem to be able to detect other creatures with cold blood, such as reptiles. Instead, SCP-799 will metamorphose into a more predatory form in order to consume any warm-blooded mammal or human being it encounters, transforming its feeding orifices and digestive tract into a singular mouth lined with several rolls of sharp, pointed teeth. From there, it will wrap up the largest warm-blooded animal it can find, whether that be a hamster or a grown man, and will tear off parts of its prey, reducing them to little more than a thin slurry as it digests their body mass to feed itself. So if you move into a new house and come across an old knitted blanket, maybe consider throwing it out, if you want to live. High school is a turbulent time for a lot of us, to say the least. Subjects are a lot harder, classes feel longer, and because you're older, there can be so much more pressure put on you by your teachers and parents alike. There's a lot more onus for you to perform well in tests and make sure that you get good grades, thanks to everyone around you telling you that these are the most important years of your life, or that your high school experience will determine your whole future for good or for bad. Actually, come to think of it, pressure feels like a bit of an understatement. As if there weren't already enough things to worry about when you're trying to make your way through high school, the changes to yourself get thrown into the mix as well. Growing up and getting older often means developing a further, previously unseen level of self-awareness and understanding of who you are as a person. That can be true of any part of life, but high school can often be the first time we're aware of ourselves in such a heightened way. Usually everything we're experiencing during that time can make some of us self-conscious, shying away from others to avoid embarrassment or becoming brash and loud to overcompensate for just how uncertain they might be feeling deep down. Then, of course, on top of that already huge mountain, romantic feelings get thrown into the mix as well. Sure, in the grand scheme of things, high school romances are usually just tiny, almost insignificant footnotes in the stories of our lives, but obviously, they don't feel like it at the time. When you're right there, living through that part of your life without the benefit of hindsight that comes later, your high school crush can feel like the very center of the entire universe. Being introduced to and surrounded by more people than ever, more than any previous stage of schooling, means that romantic feelings usually have a higher likelihood of developing and are made more prominent by the whole other whirlwind of things that high school brings with it. Case in point, Ellie was having this exact problem. For as long as she could remember, she had never really got people. They were confusing, complicated, and completely unpredictable. Usually, they frustrated Ellie, which made it hard for her to talk to most of her classmates, especially if she didn't already know them that well. The common ground could sometimes make it a little easier. It helped break the ice, but finding those shared interests or similarities was often harder than just spending time on her own. Then came along Marcus, or Marky, as Ellie heard he preferred to be called. On the first day of the semester, she had been placed in a new math class. The second Marky came walking through the door. She immediately found herself unable to keep her eyes off him, especially because he ended up taking the seat directly in front of hers, meaning he was always filling up most of her view when she looked straight ahead. Despite looking like a skater type, from what Ellie observed, Marky was pretty sharp. She was no slouch herself, usually noting down correct answers a few moments before whoever the teacher called on. Whenever Marky was called on, he also had the exact right solution to whatever problem or equation the rest of the class was probably still struggling to keep up with. Despite knowing very little about him, Ellie couldn't help feeling a certain new and unfamiliar way towards this particular classmate. It was like they were both operating at the same speed, on identical wavelengths, if only she knew more about him. And it was during class that Ellie had an idea about how she could get to know him better, but without the awkward, uncomfortable interactions that came from slipping about on the ice rather than breaking it. She could use the doll. Sure, she had been mulling it over, toying with the possibility for a while, but wasn't certain that it was right for her to follow that course of action. 
But as the days turned into weeks, getting deeper and deeper into the semester brought with it the possibility that another girl would catch Marky's attention the way he had caught Ellie's. Just the thought of that alone made her want to cry. She couldn't bear to see it become reality. One day in class, her chance presented itself on what had been an unusually hot day. The scorching heat outdoors was causing all the students to groan in discomfort, barely able to acknowledge anything other than the high temperature. Meanwhile, all the teachers could possibly do was open up the windows to counteract the relentless weather, but it was nothing more than a futile gesture. Sitting down in front of Ellie, Marky shrugged off the denim jacket he always wore, leaving it to hang over the back of his chair. Her eyes honed in on what she needed. Clinging to the surface of the acid wash material was a single strand of black hair. She knew she had to pick her moment carefully. If the teacher or any of the other students in the class, or worst of all, Marky himself saw what she was doing, it would look beyond weird. Leaning forward on her desk as subtly as she could, Ellie slowly reached forward. Her fingers wouldn't reach. The back of Marky's chair was just an inch or two further than her arms extended. Ellie felt her heart stop for a split second as her crush moved in his chair, the shift causing the jacket to move and the strand of his hair dropped, almost falling out of sight. Sighing with relief as silently as she could, when she saw the black streak manage to stay attached to the denim, Ellie fished a pen out from inside her pencil case. Leaning forward again, she delicately lifted the pointed tip of her pen, hooking the hair onto it. Pulling it back towards her before anyone saw, she covered it with her hand, both to hide what she had done and to stop the precious hair from being caught by the warm, humid breeze pouring through the open windows. Gently, she placed the one missing component she needed into a clean tissue, which she then folded four times and kept in her jacket, constantly checking throughout the day to make sure it was still there. On more than one of those quick spot checks, Ellie felt her heart plummet downwards for a second when she couldn't immediately feel the tissue in her pocket, only to calm down a second later to realize it was still there, with its precious contents inside, too. The rest of the day, she felt tense, drumming her fingers together in impatience, every hour feeling like it would go on forever. It was just a case of waiting out the day, until that final bell rung. The moment she was able, she rushed away from the school, walking home as quickly as she possibly could, one hand in her pocket to keep the hair secure. Ellie was lucky enough, or unlucky depending on your view, to live in the same town as her school, and not too far away to need the bus. She could make her way there on foot in pretty decent time. Normally, the buses from the school would pass her as she walked. Looking up, she saw one of the huge yellow vehicles driving down the street, and a familiar face sat at a window seat, Marky. Seeing him, Ellie quickened her pace speed walking home. The moment she unlocked the front door and closed it behind her, she threw off her backpack and raced upstairs to her bedroom. She knew exactly where she'd left it. As she flipped on her lamp, it was laying there on the desk ready for her, the naughty stalker. The tiny doll was made of one single knitted string with a pair of shiny onyx beads against the red of its face in the place of eyes. Ellie had come across the little oddity in a box of her grandmother's things. Although she never knew her all that well after she had died, Ellie's mom had gone to clear her house up and came back with a few boxes full of keepsakes. These are all your grandma's things I couldn't sell or think of what to do with, her mother explained offering her the cardboard box. If you can pick out anything that you like, it's yours, El. I'm sure grandma wouldn't mind. Looking inside, there wasn't much save for a few old clothes, knickknacks, souvenirs, and trinkets that were mostly all broken, or the odd piece of jewelry that looked too worn out and rusted to wear. But right at the bottom was the doll. It was wrapped up in a crumpled piece of paper that might have been clear white at some point, but had changed shades with age. Unfolding it, Ellie read the message inscribed on one side. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone, but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move and their every word. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string on our naughty stalker, and see what you're missing. Another wonderful product, brought to you by The Factory. Now that same crumpled note was in Ellie's hands, 
her eyes scanning over the instructions a final time to make sure she knew exactly what to do. She didn't much care for the name of it though, Naughty Stalker. The latter word had a very negative connotation. What she was doing here wasn't stalking, Ellie told herself. She just wanted an easier way to learn about Marky. Surely there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. Pulling the tissue from her pocket, she carefully lay it flat on the desk and unfolded it. The hair was still there, secured between the thin folded paper. Delicately holding it between her finger and thumb, Ellie held the dark strand of Marky's hair in the light of her desk lamp. She treated it as gently as she could, making sure not to break the hair, worried that the doll might not work if it snapped. Taking great care, she slipped it through one of the loops in the naughty stalker's string. For a moment, nothing happened. The doll just lay there on the wooden surface of the desk. It was completely still, not showing even the slightest hint of any change. Feeling the worry building more and more, her heart drumming against her chest so loud that she could practically hear it, Ellie started frantically looking back over the instructions, in case she had somehow missed a step. She had no idea what was meant to happen, or even what she'd been expecting, but she was starting to think that this doll might have just been an oddity from an old toy store that marketed them to children by promising things that weren't actually possible. See you later, guys. A tiny little voice came from the desk, causing Ellie's heart to lurch in shock. The doll was standing upright on the wooden surface. Only seconds before, it had been lying flat on its back, as if by its own accord, the little knitted figure was upright, like it was a living thing. And it wasn't just standing. Its arm was waving and its chest was even gently undulating to mimic the motion of breathing. The naughty stalker kept waving a moment, only to drop its head forward and make an exhaling motion that seemed to be a sigh. I really wish they wouldn't keep calling me Marky. The same voice spoke up again, this time more clearly coming from the doll. Ellie watched it closer, transfixed with utter fascination. She was aware of the concept of a voodoo doll, a mystical charm that contained a person's hair affixed to a crude figure in order to influence them through magic. This doll seemed much the same, except it was mimicking Marcus's every move. Ellie had overheard him talking to some of his friends in the corridors at school once, talking about home. He lived in the next town over, and the bust must have only just arrived there, because now the doll was walking on the spot, the same heavy-limbed, tired walk home after a long, strenuous day at school. She recognized the walk. It was the same one she did when she made her own way back to her mom's house. For the rest of the night, Ellie didn't take her eyes off the naughty stalker, watching as it streamed Marcus's actions to her live. She watched in real time as he arrived home, sat and did his homework, and went back downstairs to eat dinner, all the while Ellie was neglecting to do those same things herself. At one point in the night, the doll started dancing around, singing into something invisible in its hand. It made Ellie smile uncontrollably to watch. She had figured out that Marcus was now playing some music through a pair of headphones or a speaker and singing along in a hairbrush, dancing like no one was watching. The kind of thing that almost everyone does when they're alone, but never admits to. Turning to her computer, keeping one eye on the doll, refusing to stop watching it even in her peripheral vision, Ellie typed the lyrics it was singing into a search engine. Immediately, pages worth of results came up for the song and the band that had sung it. They weren't a group that she had heard of or listened to before, but it was Friday. She had all weekend. Using her mom's card, Ellie ordered herself a t-shirt with the band's name on it. Premium delivery meant it would be there before school next week. On Monday, she showed up at the school wearing the new shirt. It was a few sizes too big, but that meant that the band's logo printed on the front was bigger and harder to miss. Ellie had spent almost her whole weekend watching the doll as it mimicked Marcus's movements. He hadn't done much but play video games and go to the skate park, but she made sure she knew what he was doing. Anytime she wasn't watching, she was listening to the music he liked, getting familiar with it to prepare herself for what was about to happen, as if she had been studying to get ready for a test. Somehow, striding through the corridors full of students milling about first thing in the morning, Ellie felt more confident than ever. Hey, Marcus, she greeted, spotting her crush rummaging around in his locker and walking straight up to him. Hey, ah, uh, he paused, looking over her for what felt like the first time. Y you're, um, sorry, we have class together, right? Math, yeah. She replied, surprising herself at how quickly she'd recovered from the blow that he didn't even know her name. I'm Ellie, I sit right behind you. 
Right, right. Marcus smiled. You don't have to use my full name. Everyone just calls me Marky around here. But you don't like that nickname. I can tell. Ellie shot him a smile, trying to do her best mysterious voice. How, how can you tell? He asked. Don't tell anyone? She leaned forward and whispered. But I'm kind of psychic. They both laughed and Ellie caught Marcus's eye reading the band name on her shirt. Hey, I had no idea that you were a Parallel Lunatics fan, he remarked. That's my favorite band. Well, I just started listening to them, Ellie replied. Maybe you could recommend me some more of their albums? Suddenly the school bell sounded, interrupting their conversation with a reminder that the day had to start. Waving goodbye and heading to class, Ellie was unable to stop herself from smiling now that her way in had worked. For the rest of the week, she kept relying on the doll. Every moment she wasn't in class, she was holding it to her ear, listening to Marcus's half of every conversation. The more she did, the more she learned about him, what music he liked, where he was thinking of going to college, and what he wanted to study there. Every time she passed him in the hallway, she'd give him a smile and wave, just to remind him that she was there. It was a long game, but she hoped it would end in the way she wanted. Nine days had passed since she started using the doll, and that's when it started to become somewhat unreliable. Over the weekend, it had been moving as though Marcus was at the skate park again, but when Ellie approached him to ask how his weekend was and if he'd enjoyed going skating, he looked at her with confusion. Marcus said he'd been visiting his dad that weekend and didn't have any time to go anywhere near the skate park. But that one inaccuracy was nothing compared to what she heard the doll say next. Still using it to listen in on Marcus's conversations, the naughty stalker had started relaying words that made her heart shatter into a thousand fragments. She overheard him talking to a friend about her, saying horrible things, like how he thought she was weird and that she had clearly listened to parallel lunatics just to get his attention. Worst of all was when Ellie heard Marcus say through the doll that he would never want to date a girl like her. She was heartbroken, tears streaming down her face as she hid in the toilet cubicle during lunch break. Sniffling, wiping her eyes in her baggy band t-shirt, Ellie felt her sadness turning into a wave of rising anger. Throwing the door open, she marched out of the bathroom and started searching the school for Marcus. How could you say those things about me? She yelled furiously when she found him sitting on the window ledge halfway up a stairwell. Huh? He mumbled, lifting up his headphones, instantly noticing that she seemed upset. Hey, Ellie, are you okay? You're a jerk. She screamed, almost choking on sobs that threatened to come bursting out in a flood of tears. Why were you saying horrible stuff about me? What are you talking about? Marcus asked, his face looking utterly confused. Don't play dumb. You said I thought I was weird and that you'd never date someone like me. Whoa, Ellie, I don't know who told you that, but that's not true. I mean, I don't know you all that well, but I never say anything like... He tried to reply. Liar! She cut him off with another yell. I heard you. I was listening to every word. What do you mean you were listening? The confusion on Marcus's face quickly turned to concern. In his mind, he was quickly putting two and two together. The band shirt, the question about the skate park. Have you been following me? Instantly, Ellie felt her stomach flip, her anger partially dissipating and replaced with fear. No, no, it's not like that, she said, trying to ease his look of obvious alarm. I, I just wanted to know more about you, and now I do. What the hell does that mean? Marcus asked, sounding almost frightened. I, I know everything about you. Ellie started stepping closer, thinking if she went in for a hug that might calm them both down. I know all your favorite music, what you like to do for fun. I wanted to know because I really like you, but I didn't know how to talk to you. S stay away from me. Instinctively, Marcus's arm reacting to her getting too close pushed Ellie backwards. Behind her was nothing but a sharp drop and a flight of concrete steps. With a scream, she tumbled backward, her body barreling down the stairs until her head hit the ground at the bottom of the last stair, giving a sickening crack as her neck broke. Teachers could barely hold back the students that came crowding out, trying to get a better look as the paramedics came to take Ellie away. As they lifted her body onto a stretcher, nobody noticed something fall out of her pocket. An unused, naughty stalker doll. A brand new instance of SCP-693. Joe sighed to himself quietly. Looking out of the window at the still, silent stretch of highway snaking through the desert, only to disappear somewhere over the horizon. The sun was slowly crawling down, almost completely vanished from sight, and he knew when it was gone, there'd be no light left in the desert. It wasn't the same kind of darkness you found in a city, 
There they had streetlights and cars whizzing through with their headlights on full blast. It never really got dark in the cities, but out here, nothing but true pitch black darkness for miles around, only alleviated when the sky was clear enough for the stars to shine through or broken by the beams of a passing car speeding down the highway. Giving another sigh, Joe sipped on his coffee. By this point, it was lukewarm to match the dropping temperature outside and bitter to the taste. But he needed the caffeine to keep himself awake. After all, he had a long night ahead of him, but then again, they were all long nights in this line of work. This was the only diner for miles around, and he had no idea just how many hours it would be before he next got to eat or drink anything. With an almost empty pot with the last dregs of coffee in one hand, the waitress came up to Joe at his table. It was the last spot in the diner with anyone still sitting in it. Closing time, she told him with a tired smile. One for the road? Nodding, Joe lifted his travel mug for her to fill. As her workday was ending, his was about to start. He grabbed his jacket and slung it over his shoulder, leaving a few dollars as a tip on the table before he made his way out of the diner and over to his car. Buckling into the driver's seat, Joe took a deep breath as he pulled his phone out of his pocket, dreading the potential barrage of notifications that would come flooding through the second he did. Opening up the corresponding app, he clocked in for the night, and sure enough, was instantly met with a veritable tidal wave of requests. Grumbling quietly to himself, he tapped accept on the first one he saw and turned the key in the ignition. Working as a driver for a carpool and ride-sharing service was far from a simple job at the best of times, but even more so in this particular area of the southwestern United States. The state of New Mexico shared a border not only with Texas, but with Chihuahua, one of the northernmost states of Mexico. Being so close to the border meant that most of the calls and requests for lifts that Joe received on an average night meant he needed to bounce back and forth between the US and Mexico crossing the border at his client's request. Legally, of course. We're not going all Breaking Bad here today. Some nights weren't so complicated. Someone might just need a quick ride from Dona Ana to the town of truth or consequences, a New Mexico town named after, we kid you not, a TV game show. Sure, that might have been a 75-mile drive up the I-25, but at least it didn't involve crossing from El Paso into the city of Juarez. At this time of night, it was nowhere near as busy as during the day, but even so, that didn't make hopping back and forth over the border and all the red tape it entailed any less of an arduous process, especially stuck behind the wheel of a car for hours on end. Tonight, however, wasn't a simple night. Joe's first call was for a pickup from a couple whose flight had been rerouted to the international airport in Juarez. They seemed to be newlyweds and demanded to be taken all the way back to a hotel in Las Cruces, making it abundantly clear that they didn't want to stay closer to the airport and outright refusing when Joe offered to recommend them some nearby hotels. Getting to know most of the area around the three-way intersection between New Mexico, Texas, and the Mexican border after driving around it so many times, he'd gotten to know the area pretty well. Unfortunately, not everyone wanted to hear a display of Joe's local knowledge. Most of them just wanted him to drive them in silence. Next up, a group of rowdy guys, real frat house types from the University of El Paso, Texas. They wanted to be taken to a bar halfway across the city. A bit more of a straightforward trip, Joe thought. Although he could have done without them drunkenly chanting spring break at the top of their lungs every five minutes. After that, it was another jaunt across the border, this time transporting a suit and Stenson-wearing Texas gentleman to Horizon City. He spent the whole ride on his phone, talking at length about a business deal he'd just closed, not saying a word to Joe the entire time. Doug Dimadome, eat your heart out. The next person to request a lift wasn't much more talkative either. She was a 20-something girl who plainly stated she just wanted to get far away from Sierra Blanca. Hours and hours had ticked by since Joe had left the diner. The last of the coffee in his travel mug had been finished long before. His next ride request had come through and required him to once again make the drive out to the other side of the border. By this point, the evening had turned into night and was now approaching the earliest hours of the following morning, the desert still filled with nothing but deep, inky blackness. The same desert that had scorched acres upon acres of skin that had taken so many lives, big and small, and had picked the skin and flesh from countless bones. The desert can be a truly merciless place at the best of times, but sometimes 
there's a little something more out there, just waiting for you, dark and hungry. Occasionally, as he drove back towards El Paso, Joe would see another car speeding towards him on the other side of the highway, but it was so dark that he could see nothing of the driver. Only their headlights were visible, right up until they drove past him, everything behind the hood of the oncoming car almost imperceptible as it whizzed through the night. Crossing the border so many times a night, Joe had become friendly with a few of the officers that patrolled the gates, waving cars past after they'd shown the necessary paperwork. He was never usually held there for long enough to start actual conversations with them, exchanging only a friendly nod or one-liner with the few Border Patrol guards whose names he could still remember. But sometimes, when things were a little quieter at the gates, he'd overhear the odd passing comment while his driver's side window was rolled down. Tonight, as the long barrier in front of his car was raised, Joe caught a few words coming through on a radio belonging to one of the guards, something vague about sightings of phantom lights. He chuckled to himself, writing it off as yet another alleged alien sighting. Something about the desert at night really seemed to capture people's imaginations, Joe thought to himself, as he pulled away from the border gate, heading for the I-10. There were always stories like that circulating around this area of New Mexico. It was easy to see why, being so close to Roswell, New Mexico, the home of alien sightings, and just a couple hundred miles away from the true alien mecca, Area 51, a United States Air Force base that secretly housed alien life forms and spaceships, allegedly at least, if years of conspiracy believers and Facebook memers are to be believed. Every so often, one of Joe's passengers would ask him about unidentified flying objects, or he'd overhear them talking amongst themselves about a slew of urban legends, phantom hitchhikers that would hitch rides on the highway, only to vanish from the back seats of cars, and of course, tales of disembodied floating lights either hovering way up in the sky or just above the ground. Regardless of whichever one was popular at any given moment, Joe knew there were plenty of weird and spooky stories coming out of the desert. What he was unaware of, however, was that he was currently in one of his own. He'd been so wrapped up in thoughts of what he might do if one of the people that hired him turned out to be a wandering spirit that Joe didn't even notice he had made a wrong turn. It was only by the virtue of glancing at his car's GPS that he even realized, and by then, it had been long enough since that he was completely unsure how far back it was that he had made such an error. According to the map, he was… nowhere. He hadn't stopped. His car was still moving at a steady speed down the long stretch of asphalt, but the GPS didn't show any road at his current location. He had no clue which part of which highway he was even on. Short on options and short on time to get to his next client for the night, Joe just did what his job required of him. He kept on driving. Anyone watching from a distance would have seen an empty, lengthy portion of highway with but one single car traveling along it, only the headlights both illuminating the road in front of it and giving away the car's position. Slowing down slightly just to play it safe, Joe tried searching up where he was using the Maps app on his phone. He figured he wouldn't get stopped for checking his phone while driving or be much risk to any other drivers on the road. After all, it seemed like his was the only car around for miles. Even if he was still heading in near enough the right direction for his next pickup, that would be at least some saving grace. Maybe the map on the car's built-in GPS was a little outdated, he thought, and that was preventing this part of the highway from showing up. Connection to the internet was extremely limited this far out in the New Mexico desert, and by the time the map loaded, it didn't provide much in the way of new information or even the slightest bit of comforting reassurance. It only seemed to agree with the GPS that Joe was well and truly lost. As he took his free hand off the wheel for a split second, just to try and zoom in on the satellite view of the terrain, two bright white lights appeared in the distance. Startled, Joe dropped his phone into the front passenger seat, hearing it slip onto the floor of the car as he gripped the steering wheel again, both hands back to ten and two. The lights were speeding in the opposite direction he was driving in, a fair few feet ahead of him, but still, it was another vehicle on this otherwise empty, isolated stretch of the highway. A loud and sudden idea rang out in Joe's head. If he could signal what he had assumed to be another approaching car, he could ask the driver where exactly he was and what the quickest route to get back to the I-10 was. He couldn't guarantee he would make the oncoming vehicle stop and help him after all. So few people would willingly trust a stranger on the highway, but considering his only other options were to either keep driving along this seemingly endless road, or to turn back around and try to find wherever it was he'd made the wrong turn in the first place, needless to say Joe's hands were a little tied. 
Tapping the appropriate switch affixed to his wheel, he flicked on his own headlights on and off in an effort to catch the other driver's attention. Nothing. The pair of headlights kept their current course, both theirs and Joe's traveling parallel to each other, as if they were about to joust with their beams of light. Hitting the switch again, Joe tried lowering his headlight setting and then raising them back to full brightness. Still nothing from the other driver. He pushed the emergency button that activated both the front and rear lights of the car, but this one only yielded the same result. Deciding there was nothing else that he could do, Joe gently pulled his vehicle over, parking abruptly at this side of the highway. He instinctively checked his rear view, only to remember that there wasn't anyone behind him, just him and the apparently oblivious driver approaching ahead. In a last-ditch effort to get their attention, Joe punched the car horn, rolling down his window in order to listen for a response. The blaring noise echoed through the empty desert night, a loud and sustained blast followed by a beat of silence as Joe paused waiting to hear the same sound back from the oncoming vehicle. He squinted at it through the dark. It was still pretty far, but closing rapidly, or as far as he could tell it was. All he had to go on was the advancing lights, with nothing visible behind them. Joe leaned out of his window, hoping that it would somehow give him better visibility through the sheer darkness of a desert at night. It did as little to improve things as a second, much longer blast of his horn did. The other driver still didn't react. By now, the lights were close enough that whoever was behind the other wheel would be able to see Joe. And yet, they didn't do anything to change their speed, didn't flicker their lights back or sound their own horn. Nothing. Just the same two points of light. They might as well have been floating just above the ground, given how they obscured what was behind them. At this point, Joe was certain they were close enough to see him now. Little more than a few feet in front of his stationary car and still closing at a sustained speed. Getting agitated, he went to hit his horn a third time when he noticed something, or rather, he noticed something that he hadn't. This car hurtling towards him through the night wasn't making any sound. It wasn't just that the other driver deliberately hadn't returned the signals Joe had been trying to give, there was no noise coming from it whatsoever. No grumbling of an engine, nor the rolling of rubber tires against the asphalt surface of the highway. It was silent, just the pair of ominous lights soundlessly racing through the night heading straight for where Joe was sat, parked still, a sitting duck like he was defenseless prey. Violently turning the key in the ignition, Joe slammed his foot down on the accelerator. His car sputtered to life and careened down the road. He was headed straight for the other car, if it even was a car, hoping to shoot straight past it and take his chances continuing along the highway alone. The lights were almost on top of him now, still too bright to make out anything behind them but there was still no engine noise, nothing to indicate what the hell it even was, until one of them jumped onto the hood of his car. An orb of light, attached to a thrashing shape beneath, parted from the other. It leaped through the air and came down right in the path of Joe's car, just as he was about to pass what he first thought to be another car. The light smashed directly through the windshield, Joe instinctively lifting an arm to cover his face and protect his eyes from the impending shower of broken glass. But it was in that second that he took his eyes off the road that the other light made its move. It had been perfectly parallel with Joe's car, only to turn sharply and violently, connecting with the driver's side door with enough force to not only dent the metal surface, but to completely lift the car up. It barreled sideways, tumbling over itself off the highway and into the surrounding desert. Trapped inside, buckled tight, Joe was thrown about in his seat, unable to study himself as the car rolled. His arm was still over his face, splinters of glass showering over him. The whatever it was, was still thrashing about, its glow illuminating the entire interior of the car, until the whole vehicle came to a stop, landing upside down, wheels in the air pointing up at the cloudy night sky. Hanging the wrong way up, Joe reached for his seatbelt and unclasped it. His head instantly dropped onto the ceiling of the upturned car. Through the shattered driver's side window, he crawled out on his hands. The pain was shooting through his whole body, bruises and blood covering his arms, an intense, agonizing feeling of broken bones on top of that. Rolling over onto his back, Joe looked up at the wreck of his car, his livelihood, and the monster standing in front of it. Illuminated fully for the first time by the car's still active headlights, the thing had managed to pull itself free from the destroyed windshield and was now pacing slowly around the overturned hood. It walked on two legs, but it didn't move like a man. In fact, it didn't even look like one. It was like something pulled straight out of prehistoric times. A pair of hinged limbs supporting a streamlined reptilian body with hooked claws on its feet. Its back was arched, keeping itself low as its two arms stayed close to its center. 
The creature had almost human-like hands, but each finger was tipped with long, pointed talons. But its head was what Joe saw first, what he had seen at a distance and mistaken for car headlights only a few minutes ago. In the place he wouldn't have expected to see a pair of slitted eyes staring at him was a bulbous mass of a head. Bioluminescent light glowed from beneath the monster's skin, a brain visible amongst a web of bright organs, and beneath that, a wide, gaping maw of sharp teeth. Joe noticed another light drawing near, brightening the area where he lay defenseless. The second of the raptor-like monsters was pacing closer to him, both their glowing heads kept low to the ground ready to strike. Yep, looks pretty clear to me, one of the men disguised as a highway patrol officer announced. Handprints match up with what their front paws look like, no trace of the driver, just a big wreck in the middle of nowhere. Ah, better get on the horn to control then, his colleague replied, wearing a similar uniform. I thought SCP-745s were only found a little north of here. Ah, we shut off the section of the highway they usually show up at, the first foundation agent explained casually sipping his coffee as he looked at the upturned wreckage of Joe's car. His body was nowhere to be found, but every now and then a couple of them will show up a bit away from there. One of them wouldn't come this far into the south of New Mexico on its own though. Ah, because of the lights, right? His fellow agent responded, the two of them walking back towards the car. Ah, their heads, they mimic car headlights or something. Well, there's that. The first man nodded, taking one last look at the long open desert around them and the highway stretching through it. Plus, it must get lonely traveling out here on your own. An elderly woman watches from her living room window as heavy sheets of rain fall outside. She rocks back and forth in her chair nervously. It's been raining for days. The road is washed out. I can't get into town. Oh, what am I to do? What am I to do? She says out loud to herself. The rocking chair creaks under her weight, but not as much as it had three days ago, before she ran out of food. I am so hungry, the old lady moans. She glances at the door that leads to her basement. Maybe I can find something to eat down there. She stands up. Her 90-year-old bones creak as she slowly shuffles towards the basement door. The empty chair rocks back and forth from the old woman's momentum, as if someone is still sitting in it. She opens the door and looks into the pitch-black darkness. There are no windows down there. The only light is connected to a drawstring in the middle of the room. The old woman slowly makes her way down the uneven wooden steps. When she reaches the bottom, she reaches out her wrinkled hand, groping in the darkness for the drawstring. Her hand brushes something. It feels like sticky yarn. Then she feels the legs of a spider scurry up her arm. The old woman lets out a shriek as her hand locates the string and she pulls hard. The light flickers on. It creates a dim glow but at least she can now see what's in the basement. The string swings back and forth, casting a snake-like shadow on the far wall. The old woman scans the floor for anything to eat. A leftover tuna can, some pickled vegetables, a rat. Anything will do at this point. There is nothing there. The old woman feels her strength has been almost completely drained. She doesn't know how she'll make it back up the stairs. In desperation, she looks around the basement one last time. Her eyes fall on an old rusty saw. She pauses for a moment. I need to eat, she whispers. The old woman slowly walks towards the saw. She picks it up and examines it. God gave me two hands for a reason, she says, her eyes locked on the rusty blade. She places one hand on the wooden workbench that sits against the wall and grips the saw tightly with the other. The old woman takes a deep breath and brings the saw down towards her hand. Where are we going? D-94322 asks the SCP agent driving the car. House on Hadley Hill, the agent responds. Well, that doesn't sound creepy at all, D-94322 says as he cranes his neck to get a glimpse of the top of the mountain through the SUV window. Why don't we just play the quiet game until we get there, the agent says as he focuses on the pothole-ridden back roads of Mount Zion, Georgia. D-94322 holds on tightly to the handhold above him to keep his body from slamming into the door every time they go over a big bump. They continue on for a few more minutes when a rundown house comes into view. The agent pulls off the road and stops the SUV. Here you go, he says, handing D-94322 an earpiece. What am I supposed to do with this? D-94322 asks. Just stick it in your ear, the agent says with just a little contempt in his voice. You don't have to be rude about it. 
D94322 replies as he grabs the earbud and sticks it in his ear. Hello, testing, anybody out there? Hello, D94322. Can you hear me? Says a voice in his head. Uh, yeah. You can just call me D94 for short. D94322 is kind of a mouthful. Very well. The voice from the earbud agrees. My name is Dr. Andrews. I will be walking you through this test with SCP-4173. All right, Doc, shall we get this party started? D-94 says as he steps out of the SUV. He looks up at the house that sits atop Hadley Hill. The sky is dark and clouds race over the mountain as if they would rather be anywhere else but here. Here we go. D-94 starts walking up the slippery hill, being careful not to fall. He reaches the overgrown walkway leading up to the house and pauses. Is there a problem? Dr. Andrews asks. No, just trying to psych myself up to go into this creepy house, responds D-94. What's inside anyways? That is not your concern at the moment. But if you do exactly as I tell you, you should be in and out in no time. <laughs> Whatever you say, Doc. D-94 walks down the path, reaches his hand out, and grips the cool brass knob. He turns it and pushes the door open. The inside of the house smells like mothballs and decay. All right, I'm in, he says. Good, head down the hallway and turn to your left. You'll see a door that leads to the basement. Let me know when you're there. D-94 walks down the hallway. The old wooden floor groans under his feet. He reaches the basement door. It's slightly ajar. Ugh, this place gives me the creeps. Rightfully so. Dr. Andrews chimes in. It is an old spooky house on top of an old spooky hill in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, it's going to be creepy. An old woman died here under mysterious circumstances around 20 years ago, but you don't really need to worry about that. No ghosts here, I think. You think? D-94 shouts as he takes a step away from the basement door. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's nothing but harmless old SCP-4173 in that house. And when has an SCP ever hurt anyone, right? There is a long, uncomfortable pause. <clears throat> Anyways, why don't you head on downstairs so we can get you out of there as soon as possible? Yeah, sure, D-94 says as he begins his descent into the darkness. I can't see anything. Is there a light? No, I think it burnt out years ago. But that's okay, I can guide you. It's what I'm here for, says Dr. Andrews. Walk towards the east wall, but watch your head. The ceiling is low in that corner. You'll see what you're looking for when you get there. D-94 is silent for a moment. East? He asks. Turn left, Dr. Andrews responds. Oh, all right, why didn't you say so, Doc? D-94 turns left and walks forward. After a few feet, there's a loud bang as he slams his head into the ceiling. Son of a bitch! I told you to watch your head. Yeah, thanks says D-94 as he rubs the bump forming beneath his hair. This place is even spookier than the first floor, you know that, right? I promise there's nothing in that room right now that can hurt you, Dr. Andrews reassures D-94. Wait, what do you mean right now? Don't worry about it, just let me know when you reach the wall, D-94. After a few seconds, D-94's eyes adjust to the darkness. He can just make out the damp concrete wall in front of him. It looks as if the wall is perspiring. I'm here, he says. Good. There's a little door, maybe five feet to your left. You see it? Asks Dr. Andrews. D-94 turns. Yeah, I, I see it. it. It's closed. The door itself is not very big, maybe a foot long and a half a foot wide. Open it, says Dr. Andrew. D-94 hesitates. What, what's in there? Nothing, just open it. Dr. Andrews repeats himself. No way, man, you're lying, and I'm not opening anything until you tell me what's on the other side of that door. Dr. Andrews sighs. We both know that you're going to do as I say, D-94322. You have no other choice, unless you want to go back to that death row cell block where we found you. D-94 shakes his head and rubs the bridge of his nose. Fine, fine, he says. Dr. Andrews can hear the squeaking of hinges through the microphone on D-94's earbud. It's open, now what? Do you see anything? Uh, no. There's some cobwebs and dirt, but other than that, it's just dark. D-94 thinks for a moment. Why is this little door here? Is this some, like, pet door or something? You have to be, I don't know, pretty small to get in there. Agreed. Just hang tight and let me know when you hear something. We won't keep you there for long. Hear something? Like, like what? 
asks D-94. You'll know when you hear it, says Dr. Andrews. Five minutes go by without a sound. Then ten. Fifteen. The basement is damp and cold. D-94 thinks he sees creatures scurrying around the floor, but he doesn't say anything because acknowledging them makes his situation more real and a lot more scary. After a half hour of waiting in silence, D-94 screams, What the heck was that? What was what? Dr. Andrews is startled out of a daydream by the shouts of D-94 in his ear. Something just moved past the door. I definitely saw it. What in God's name was that? Yells D-94. Dr. Andrews tries to remain calm, but he can barely contain his excitement. The entity in the wall is why you're down there. What do you mean? You said there wasn't anything down here. I said there was nothing down there that could hurt you. If you follow my instructions, this will continue to be true. Can you hear anything? Asks Dr. Andrews. No, I can't hear it. But before D-94 can finish his sentence, a voice speaks from behind the wall. He can't understand what the voice is saying at first, but as his heart begins to slow and the blood stops thumping in his ears, D-94 can make out her words. Oh, thank goodness. I wasn't sure you'd be able to find me. What took you so long? Says the voice of an old woman. D-94 takes a step back from the door. There's someone on the other side of that wall? He hisses into the microphone at Dr. Andrews. Tell it that the road is out, and you had to find another way up, says Dr. Andrews in D-94's earpiece. What? Why? Just do it if you want to get out of there, D-94, Dr. Andrews says a little impatiently. Ah, uh, the, the road is out, so I had to find another way up, says D-94 to the little open door in the wall. Oh yes, the rain washed it out. I was worried I would never get to see another person again being stuck up here and all. G can you see me? Asks the voice. Um, no, I, I can't, says D-94. Doc, what is on the other side of that wall? Come over here a little closer. I, I can't see you properly either, says the voice. It's fine, you can get closer, just don't touch the door. Dr. Andrews says, I really don't want to do that, says D-94. Do it, and you will be that much closer to getting out. I hate you, whispers D-94. He slowly approaches the little door and speaks into it. He Hello? Oh, there you are. The voice pauses as if whoever is speaking is examining D-94. I'm sorry, I can't see like I used to. Oh, it's so dark in here and it's been so long. R reach through the door and let me feel your hand so I can tell you're really there. What? D-94 steps away from the door. No way am I putting my hand in there. Come on now, don't be rude. I just want to feel that you're there. It's been so long. Just, just a touch. The voice says a little harsher than before. Screw you, lady. I'm not getting my hands anywhere near this creepy hole in the wall, says D-94. He turns around and starts walking away from the little door towards the staircase leading back to the main level of the house. Before he can put his foot on the first step, D-94 hears Dr. Andrew's voice screaming in his ear. Stop moving! Look, you're going to have to do it. We haven't been able to recover anyone who refuses to do what she asks. I cannot guarantee your safety unless you put your hand through that door. Are you kidding me? shouts D-94. You're telling me that sweet, creepy old lady will somehow kill me if I don't do what she asks? We're not entirely sure what happens, but you need to put your hand through that door if you want to get out of there, says Dr. Andrews. D-94 turns back toward the little door and slowly approaches it. This is my nightmare, he says more to himself than anyone else. He reaches out slowly and puts his fingers through the doorway. He immediately pulls them back and steps away from the door. I, I, I really don't want to do this, D-94 whispers. He steps forward again and sticks his hand all the way through the doorway. For a moment, nothing happens. All, all right, I've got my hand in there. Now what? Oh, I can see you now. You're right there. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's been so long since someone came. And with a gift as well? Oh, sweetling, you're so kind, so kind to me. G gift? What gift? D-94 asks nervously. It's so dark and lonesome, and I've just been so hungry for such a long time. Thank you, sweetling. I'll take your gift from you. You are such a rude little brat, you don't really deserve it. You've had it for too long, and you don't deserve it. It's mine now. Mine for my belly. Thank you. What are you talking about, you psycho? D-94 stutters. Suddenly, something grabs his hand and pulls him against the wall. He screams in agony as Dr. Andrews hears a wet, ripping sound coming through the microphone. 
It sounds as if some type of metal instrument is cutting through flesh. Oh god! No! Help me! Help me! D94 screams. Please! 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 Dr. Andrews hears the sound of D94's body hitting the floor as he passes out. It's quiet for a moment. Don't worry, you ungrateful child. Don't worry. I'll fill you up too. You can have mine. I'll give it to you, sweet boy. Good boy, fill you up, says the old woman's voice from the other side of the wall. Dr. Andrews listens as the hinges of the little door squeak and it clicks shut. He picks up the phone next to him and dials it. Go in and get him. Bring him back to Site-94 for observation. And try to keep this one alive, please. He hangs up the phone and prepares the lab for D94322 to be brought in. D94 slowly comes out of his medically induced coma two days after the incident with SCP-4173. He's stable, but doesn't feel great. And he can't help but sense that something is different. D94 looks at where his hand should be. There's nothing there. That crazy old lady ate my hand! He starts screaming. A medical team rushes in as red lights begin to flash and sirens blare. They attempt to restrain D94. During the struggle, D94 catches a glimpse of himself in a mirror on the far side of the room. He stops fighting for a moment. There is a growth expanding from his head. What the heck is that? He yells, pointing to his reflection. D94 begins to struggle again, this time much more intensely. He begins scratching at the growth on the side of his head without much success. In the process, he pushes the growth further into his skull. It penetrates his brain. D94 blacks out. The medical team ties D94 to the bed and tries to get a reading on his vitals. The growth is putting too much pressure on his brain. They rush him to the ER, but D94322 dies before he reaches the operating table. Dr. Andrew stands over the body of the deceased Class D subject. Cut him open, he says to the doctor standing in the room. One of them pulls out a scalpel and makes an incision into the side of D94's head. What is that? One of the doctors says. The other bends over to get a better look. After a moment, he turns away and vomits into his face mask. Dr. Andrews picks up a pair of forceps off the table. He sticks them deep into the hole in the side of D94's head and clamps down hard. Dr. Andrews pulls out a decomposing hand. The fingers are still moving, as if trying to grab onto something. There is no explanation for how it got in there, but it is obvious that SCP-4173 played some sort of role in the phenomenon. Dr. Andrews goes back into his office to review previous case files on SCP-4173. Everyone who had put their hand into the small doorway has been pulled towards the wall and had their hand chopped off. The severed appendage never ends up being a clean cut, which leads Dr. Andrews to hypothesize the gruesome makeshift operation is done with some sort of tool with teeth. Once the hand of the victim is severed, SCP-4173 always thanks the person for their gift. She then informs them not to worry about their hand, as it will be replaced. But then something incredibly strange happens. Like with D-94, a decaying hand will appear somewhere in the body, but it isn't always inside the head. In fact, depending on how polite the test subject is to the old woman behind the door, the closer to the wrist the decaying hand actually ends up. For the test subjects who are rude to the old lady, the decaying hand ends up in some pretty interesting places. <laughs> she really hated D94322, chuckles Dr. Andrews to himself. Dr. Andrews continues flipping to the back of the file on SCP-4173. The SCP Foundation doesn't quite know how it happens, but people who refuse to offer their hand to SCP-4173 suffer a worse fate than those who surrender to the old lady. In every case where a subject tries to get away from the small door, some inexplicable force seems to grab them from behind and drag them through the tiny opening. In these cases, there is nothing left of the test subject. It is likely fatal as a human is much smaller than the opening itself. So the only way a body could fit through the doorway is if every bone is broken and every muscle compressed to a quarter of its actual size. I'm not sure which is worse. Dr. Andrews says aloud as he closes the file on SCP-4173. He glances at the picture paperclip to the front of the manila folder depicting the tiny doorway. He can't quite pinpoint why, but the fact that the door slowly closes after the old woman gets what she needs from her victims sends chills down his spine. The words of the old woman echo in his head. Don't worry, I'll fill you up too. You can have mine. I'll give it to you. Sweet boy, good boy, fill you up. 
Gamma would never forget the horrific sight of SCP-5967. On the surface, she kept her nerve, cool and collected, her finger ready to squeeze the trigger as her weapon stayed trained on the entity. But deep down, it turned her stomach. After all, how is someone meant to react when they see a thing like that? A mess of flesh and eyeballs towering above them, staring back through more retinas than any living creature has. She did not yet know it, but she'd still be seeing that disgusting pillar of musculature and eyes in her nightmares for months to come. And still, it wasn't even the worst part of the incursion. Far worse than seeing the five-meter-tall eyeball totem watching it blink its many lids at her was witnessing what it had done to Alpha. Only moments before, Gamma's commanding officer had been in control of the situation, leading Mobile Task Force Lambda-5 into the Meadowlands of East Rutherford, New Jersey. The mission should have been a simple smash and grab, the same old boring story their team had lived through countless times before. Pick up a high-value target, the leader of yet another cult practicing an anomalous religion, and bring him in for questioning. Gamma never could have expected that things would go this badly. The task force had arrived to discover Caesar Winters, the leader of a sect of Fifths operating in New Jersey. When Lambda-5 discovered him, Winters and his followers, locals who were all members of a group known as the Commune, were standing in a circle around an instance of SCP-5967. Standing at around 5 meters in height, SCP-5967s were piles comprised of mostly musculature and organs that resembled eyeballs, human eyeballs. Despite lacking a mouth, vocal cords, or any other conventional methods of speech, these pillars could still very much communicate verbally. Although they had little to say besides spouting phrases and principles associated with the fifthist ideology. Almost immediately, the plan to capture Winters had gone awry. It was almost like he expected the Foundation to arrive, like he knew they were coming. As the members of MTF Lambda-5 moved in, keeping Winters in their sights, the anomalous cult leader somehow turned the gaze of SCP-5967 onto Alpha. The team's field commander ordered Delta to open fire, taking out Caesar Winters in a single shot, but only for a moment. Another of the commune members kneeled over and began convulsing. A wound formed at the person's neck, and from it emerged Caesar Winter's face. It grew into a full-sized head, replacing that of the commune member, giving Winters a brand new body in moments. On Alpha's orders to stop Winters from hopping to more bodies, Gamma and the others in their team fired on the other cultists. Everyone was terminated. Fifteen seconds was all it took. Then they moved towards SCP-5967, and everything went wrong. The bodies started to convulse violently, as if some unseen hand was shaking them around like ragdolls. Gamma watched as they began to levitate, hoisted by their necks and floating towards the mobile task force. Not one of them knew what to do, keeping their rifles up and trained on the corpses. Each one folded in on itself, becoming compressed masses of muscle embedded with eyes. That was when the team lost Alpha. Something was happening to their leader. She had dropped her weapon and fallen to her knees. Immediately, Gamma moved in to help her commander, trying to pull her back to her feet. But Alpha was resisting, transfixed by SCP-5967. It's her. She is lost deep in the cosmos and is angry with us for not helping her find her way back. She will kill us all. Lest we lie in our brains and see her for who she truly is. Gamma watched as her team leaders rushed towards the pillar of eyes and licked it. The floating orbs of flesh and eyes that had once been people suddenly hurtled towards the members of MTF Lambda-5 at high speed. Gamma dove clear at the vital moment, performing a tactical role and managing to narrowly avoid being struck. Beta wasn't so lucky. Ready to retaliate, Gamma raises a weapon to fire at the floating remains, only to hear Alpha ordering her to stop. She had stopped licking SCP-5967, but whatever influence had compromised the mobile task force leader hadn't relinquished its hold over her. She grinned unnervingly as her eyes rolled back into her head. Don't you hear her voice? She is angry, but I can save you. I can save us. Let me show you, Alpha said before charging at Gamma with her arms outstretched. 
In seconds before she could defend against her commanding officer, Gamma found herself pounced upon by Alpha. Grabbing a nearby rock, Alpha swung at her head and knocked Gamma's tactical helmet clean off. Pinning her down, possessed by some unknown anomalous entity, Alpha held open Gamma's eyelids and licked her eyeball. Gamma screamed in horror as Alpha looked up to the sky and yelled, I can see you! I can see everything now! The case of SCP-5967 is one of the stranger tales within the annals of the SCP Foundation's history. Their investigation that led to the discovery of these five-foot-tall pillars of eyes and muscle originally began with a different intention. The commune had been making waves in Lindhurst, New Jersey, the kind of waves that had caught the SCP Foundation's attention. The two leaders of this apparent cult were Salem Steros and Caesar Winters, both of whom seemed to be able to use SCP-5967s to take control of the local residents' minds. Anyone that they affected could be controlled remotely by either Steros or Winters, with a seemingly unlimited range and no known way of relinquishing their control over an affected person. Amnestic treatments, hypnotherapy, none of the Foundation's usual methods had worked. Undercover Foundation operatives working secretly within the Lindhurst Police Department were the first to discover an instance of SCP-5967 right under their noses. Literally, the pillar of eyeballs seemed to have sprouted up right in the middle of the Lindhurst Police Station. The Foundation sent in containment teams to secure the area and administer amnestics to witnesses. But just how were Steros and Winters causing these monstrous musculature monoliths to appear? Well, the pair operated a radio show together, known as The Reality Sync. The Foundation agents within Lindhurst had been unable to track down exactly where they were broadcasting from. However, after the SCP-5967 instance appeared within the police station, the answer seemed to present itself. During the building's reconstruction, tapes of their radio show were recovered, seeming to suggest that the pair had been utilizing anomalous means to broadcast the reality sync from within the station itself, while keeping themselves concealed. The reality sync was a religious talk show, specifically focused on discussing elements of fithism with the audience and callers who phoned in to Winters and Steros' hidden studio. What exactly is fithism? Well, there's no easy answer to that question, unfortunately. Other anomalous cults and religions at least have a core tenet or belief at their center. Sarcasism is the worship of disease and decay, while mechanites from the Church of the Broken God venerate technology. The beliefs of the Fifth Church are a little more interchangeable, however. They don't really have any defined theology or religious practices. Fifthism is often more just a collection of recurring ideas and motifs. The number five, stars, and the belief in an external cosmic god often a malicious one. In fact, if there is a defining principle of fifism, it's that it's an anomalous way of thinking that it can't really be understood. Practitioners of fifism are concerned primarily with transcending reality as we perceive it. They are highly interested in entities and anomalies that can warp and shape reality, to the extent of even being fearful of such beings. A lot of fifths seek to not only spread their influence to others through any means necessary, including brainwashing, but also hope to transcend humanity to a higher plane of reality, the fifth dimension. There, in theory, a person would cease to be a human being, and wouldn't even really be akin to a god or powerful reality bender. Instead, they would become something more vague, a concept, unable to be fully defined or to exist in reality completely. Fithists follow this goal, presumably with the intention of saving humankind from reality-warping anomalies, and they'll use any infectious brainwashing methods at their disposal to bring as many people as they can into their way of thinking. This brings us neatly back to Caesar Winters and Salem Steros' radio show, The Reality Sync. This was the Communes, their particular sect of Fithism's, way of spreading what they referred to as the truth. Based on the various fragmented cassette recordings of their show that the SCP Foundation were able to recover, both Steros and Winters believed in a many-armed goddess, referring to it as only she or her. They encouraged their listeners to pray to this entity and let her know that they were loyal to her. During one of their recovered broadcasts, the pair of Fithis hosts were even able to prank call the SCP Foundation itself. 
One junior researcher Jones was contacted by the two men and ridiculed for his association with the SCP Foundation. But after a few jokes at junior researcher Jones' expense, Steros and Winters began to insidiously implant ideas of fifthism in the researcher's head. They referred to this as giving Jones the truth, something they both intended to do for all of their listeners in order to save them. When asked what they really meant, Winters and Steros made vague allusions to the truth being an infinite knowledge that only she could bestow. Jones had no idea who she was meant to be. Our guiding light, our creator, Salem described, before adding, the very thoughts that should be infiltrating your head right now? It seemed that through this call, the two hosts had managed to successfully embed their fifthest concepts into the mind of junior researcher Jones, and they weren't about to stop there. During another call on their show, both hosts spoke with a Wallington, New Jersey resident named Wendy Ricefield, who was already a self-proclaimed fifthist. Steros and Winters talked Wendy through a ritual to learn the truth, involving her drawing sigils on the walls and floor of her home and lighting candles. The phone line picked up wet squelching noises coming from the other side, the splintering of wood, and Wendy screaming for help as she tried to run from her home, only for something to drag her back inside. Eventually, the Foundation made the executive decision to step in and deal with the situation in New Jersey directly. Steros and Winters' operation was getting out of hand. More and more people in the surrounding area were being brainwashed into believing in fifthest concepts and compelled to complete bizarre rituals. Sending a team in to apprehend the cult leaders, Foundation personnel discovered Salem Steros and numerous other members of the commune. They had gathered at an instance of SCP-5967 that had manifested in Wallington, the same place that Wendy Ricefield had been from. Steros and his fifthest followers were discovered holding hands and standing in a circle around the anomalous pillar of eyeballs, as well as approaching it and licking SCP-5967. The members of the commune were rounded up, and most were sent to be kept in isolation at Site-9. However, Salem Steros was brought to Site-83 for questioning. Junior researcher Umar Hadid conducted an interview as to the exact nature of the goddess Her that Steros and Winters often referred to, and the anomalous rituals the pair had been involved with. Salem was less than cooperative. He demanded to be set free in the interest of saving people by spreading the truth with Caesar. However, he did reveal some key information about her. According to Steros' claims, she was a goddess actively meddling with reality and influencing human actions. He told Hadid that if he killed the junior researcher right there, it would be because she willed it. Sometime before, both Salem and his cult co-leader Caesar had been stargazing in the Meadowlands, a remote field in East Rutherford. That's when they had allegedly heard her voice and being told the truth. This reality-warping goddess was intending to return home, but that way was broken. So according to Steros, she needed their help. This was the reason he and Winters began creating instances of SCP-5967. The eyeball pillars apparently acted as beacons, like a GPS signal allowing her to come back. The pair and the rest of the commune were attempting to prove their loyalty to her, in the hopes that they would potentially be allowed to transcend reality in accordance with the fifthest principle. Salem Steros was remained into SCP Foundation custody and kept detained in a containment suite surrounded by three Scranton reality anchors. Shortly after, the members of MTF Lambda 5 were dispatched, heading to the location Steros had inadvertently revealed during his interrogation. Their mission was to arrest Caesar Winters, who remained at large after the leader of Lambda 5 was compromised. Eventually, Gamma was able to contact the Foundation, who sent a containment team as backup. They secured the surviving MTF operative along with the infected team leader, Alpha, and the instance of SCP-5967 on the scene. Gamma was offered medical treatment and presented with a silver lion badge for her efforts in the field, along with a two-week vacation as a reward. That did little to stop the nightmares, though. She wasn't the same, and neither was Alpha. After two long weeks of psychological screening, and no further hostile or anomalous activity, Alpha was interviewed by junior researcher Hadid. During their discussion, Alpha, real name Cassandra Sandy Danofsky, described that she could still hear voices in her head, rambling about the truth, fifthism, and eyeballs. Amnestic treatment wasn't helping. 
Suddenly, someone within the Foundation played a clip of Caesar Winters' voice over the facility speakers, taken from one of his and Steros' radio broadcasts. It triggered an instant paranoid reaction from Sandy, followed by her opening her mouth and revealing something growing inside. Another eyeball. Some kind of post-hypnotic suggestion or other form of brainwashing had affected her, and she began exhibiting anomalous behavior. Tell me, Hadid, are you a fifthist now? She asked the junior researcher. Are you ready to see the truth? Hadid rushed out of the room, shutting the door behind him. Pacing around the room, Sandy started drawing strange sigils of unknown origin on the floor and walls, lighting a candle through anomalous means. Then there came a bright flash of light as a four-legged entity appeared and attacked Alpha. The two merged, causing her body to change until it was unrecognizable. Well, as human anyway. Standing in the interrogation room where Sandy had been standing, was a contorted mass of flesh and muscle, with multiple eyeballs staring out from it. She had turned into another instance of SCP-5967. They all had. They were people. Steros and Winters had made beacons out of living people. Researcher Martin pushed the deck against the door, hoping it would hold long enough for him to find an alternate escape route. He wasn't thinking about the long term. He couldn't afford to. With the Foundation's global reach, he'd never truly escape them, never be able to make it away, condemned to spend the rest of his life on the run from the organization he'd devoted his life to. It was too overwhelming to even attempt to reckon with that, especially with the pounding of a fist against the door. He scrabbled around, opening windows to try and see if there was a safe way down. Technically, none of this was his fault, at least in his mind. The administrative login information he'd used to access the file shouldn't have been left so easy to find. That was just poor cybersecurity on the Foundation's part. Researcher Martin had been tasked with compiling information on SCP-001, one of the most infamous anomalies ever encountered in the Foundation's long and storied history, or multiple of them at least. What Martin had come to learn was there were numerous entities within the Foundation's files that all acted as proposals for SCP-001. Some were creatures, the typical kind of anomalous entities the Foundation dealt with on a regular basis, but some of the proposals focused on more abstract anomalies, and somehow, those were more existentially terrifying than any evil godlike being bent on destroying reality. Theories about the very source of anomalies themselves, that their very existence might have been predetermined by some otherworldly force. Then there were the other proposals that named parts of the Foundation as the true SCP-001. Those seemed to suck Researcher Martin in like a vortex, dragging him down a deep, dark rabbit hole that made him start to question everything he thought he knew about working for the SCP Foundation, and the one that had toppled him into a full-blown conspiracy-obsessed stupor that there was no coming back from, the Noir Box Proposal. The weighted head of a battering ram splintered the wooden surface of the door, spraying fragments over the room. The table propped up to keep it shut toppled under the force of the entry as a squad of shadowy figures in full black combat gear rushed inside. The mobile task force surrounded the cowering researcher, keeping their weapons trained on him. Researcher Martin, pleading for his life, started gesturing to the walls of the room around him that had been plastered with hastily scrawled diagrams and equations. Martin tried desperately to find some concise, easy-to-understand way of explaining to the soldiers what he'd uncovered. They only picked up on a few words like many worlds hypothesis and splitting universes, but ultimately they didn't follow what he was saying and weren't sent there to hear him out. All the MTF had been told was that Researcher Martin had breached Foundation security and now posed a risk of exposing sensitive information about SCP-001. There was only one path of recourse, termination. However, unbeknownst to them, Dr. Martin was fine, at least a version of him was, one who never learned about the Noir Box proposal for SCP-001 and hadn't gone mad trying to unravel its mysteries. Instead, he was a respected, higher-ranking member of the Foundation who was alive and well, in a completely different timeline. The formation of the SCP Foundation has always been shrouded in mystery, 
with nobody really knowing what the true origin of the organization is and what is merely just a cover story left in the archives to keep the truth hidden. SCP-001, the Noir Box proposal at least, might hold the answers to the questions surrounding how the Foundation came to be three times over. Known as the Tindalos Trinity, the file pertaining to this anomaly is buried deep in the SCP Foundation's database, under layers upon layers of encryption and security clearance requirements. It requires someone at the very top level of the Foundation to access, a member of either the Overseer Council or the Foundation's High Command, or Overwatch. But wait, what are those? Aren't they the same thing? Well, yes and no. The exact name of the high-ranking secretive group that runs the Foundation has often been interchangeable, whether they're known as the O5 Council, the Overseer Council, etc. But what if it wasn't just many different names for the same governing body, but actually separate names for alternate versions of the ones who control the SCP Foundation? Allow us to explain. All three of these groups, the Overseer Council, High Command, and Overwatch, have come to a consensus that SCP-001 is an anomaly that connects with the Foundation's very origin. They believe that the founder of the SCP Foundation, also known as SCP-001, was anomalous in some way that caused them to interact with time in an unusual fashion. The Triumvirate of Councils are in agreement that around the time that the SCP Foundation was formed, three distinct timelines were generated, given the anomalous nature of the organization's founder. Each of these timelines drastically altered the nature of SCP-001, featuring a different version in each one. In the first, commonly known as Timeline HC, where the Foundation is run by a high command, SCP-001 was an anomalous human corpse. This timeline's SCP-001 still exhibited all the behavioral characteristics of a normal human being, but could additionally replicate itself at an erratic, uncontrollable rate, usually when performing tasks that could have multiple possible outcomes. SCP-001 in Timeline HC also interacted anachronistically with its environment, passing through solid matter that predated it or would outlast it. So, it had to be contained in a room that was constructed before it existed as an anomaly. This timeline's SCP-001 was responsible for conceiving the idea for the SCP Foundation, and was able to promote a significant interest in the organization. However, they were assassinated before the Foundation was officially codified, with the culprits being a version of Mobile Task Force ALP-0, who are believed to have originated from either of the other two timelines. While this seems to have been done to deter the Foundation forming in this timeline, it seems to have had the opposite effect. Despite the assassination of SCP-001, occurring before the official formation of the SCP Foundation in Timeline HC, this version of the Foundation was successfully codified by the 13 members of what they referred to as High Command. Given the anomalous circumstances around the death of SCP-001, it provided a catalyst for the organization to immediately establish itself as this timeline's protection against the threat posed by anomalous entities. The body of SCP-001 was placed in the building that had been its childhood home, securing it somewhere that predated them to negate their anomalous properties. This made them the first anomaly contained by Timeline HC's version of the SCP Foundation, posthumously garnering them the official designation of SCP-001. So, that's the first of our three timelines at play. The events that unfold in the second are considerably different. In this timeline, Timeline OC, the Foundation was initially created by a different SCP-001. This entity, referred to primarily as the Founder, appropriately enough, was a human being known to possess anomalous temporal abilities. The Founder was known to also be immortal, showing no visible signs of aging, and with a resistance to external damage that prevented him from being directly killed. Any injuries he sustained could be healed, but only at the same rate typical of an average human being. The temporal side of his anomalous properties pertained to predicting the future. The Founder was able to, with an inarguable level of precision and accuracy, forecast events before they occurred. His foresight, it appeared to the Foundation, 
was not inciting these events to happen as he predicted them. However, everything he ever predicted would occur became an inevitability, impossible to delay, avert, or alter through any means. During the events of Timeline OC, and as his preferred nickname implies, the Founder was the sole figure responsible for establishing this version of the SCP Foundation. In this course of events, the O5 Council of this timeline were known as the Overseer Council. It was, however, while he was in the process of establishing the organization that things started to go awry. Whether he was able to predict this occurrence or not is unknown, although it seems to have corresponded with the MTF Alp Zero assassination of SCP-001 in the other timeline, Timeline HC. In Timeline OC, at the same time as the assassination in Timeline HC, the Founder began to exhibit his anomalous temporal properties in front of the original members of Overseer Council. However, it should also be noted that there was no recorded presence of MTF Alp Zero in Timeline OC. Believing the Founder to be a potential danger to the Foundation they had all helped to create, the Founding Overseer Council classified him as an anomalous threat. They immediately devised a set of containment measures for the Founder, now designating him as SCP-001, the first anomaly contained by this timeline's version of the Foundation. He was placed within a standard humanoid containment cell and given regular meals, while personnel were forbidden to communicate with him. Given his role in establishing the Foundation in this version of events, SCP-001 is, naturally, in favor of containing and analyzing anomalies. However, not when that includes him, and insisted that he be released. According to one of his predictions for forthcoming events, he requested to be allowed to build the device, but refused to elaborate on the intended purpose of it. SCP-001 even refused to allow other members of Foundation personnel to construct the device on his behalf for testing purposes. The third of these timelines is referred to as Timeline OW wherein the leading body of the Foundation are known as Overwatch. Here, just like the previous iterations of its history, the description of SCP-001 and their role in forming the SCP Foundation differs. In this timeline, SCP-001 is an anomaly that consists of two distinct parts. The first of these is a figure not dissimilar from the Founder. Referred to as SCP-001-1, this person is also a functionally immortal human, who doesn't age and can't heal rapidly from damage. SCP-001-1 also advocates for securing and analyzing anomalies. However, this includes himself, as he doesn't object to his own containment, or that of the second component of this SCP-001. Known as SCP-001-A, this device is capable of accurately calculating any and all possible outcomes of any event that is input into it. Unlike the Founder, who seemed to possess a foresight able to predict the only inevitable outcome of the future, SCP-001-A is able to account for the possibility of multiple potential futures, even down to accounting for how its own predictions could potentially influence or alter outcomes. In layman's terms, at least one of the eventualities predicted by SCP-001-A will always be accurate unless the predictions are to do with its own future, or the future of SCP-001-1. In this instance, the device will always produce one of two assumptions that are incorrect. Either that SCP-001-1 was killed after an assassination attempt and never constructed SCP-001-A, but that's impossible after all. SCP-001-A exists, it's already been made in this timeline. The other incorrect prediction it can give is that SCP-001-1 also exhibits the same anomalous properties as the prediction machine, more akin to the founder, and that SCP-001-A was never constructed in the first place. But again, that can't be right, in this timeline anyway. According to records within Timeline OW, their version of the Founder, who is, of course, a CP-001-1, encountered a version of Mobile Task Force Alp Zero from one of the other timelines. They presented the Founder of the OW timeline with detailed blueprints for the construction of SCP-001-A. The device's completion coincided with the assassination in Timeline HC, and the corresponding anomalous incident in Timeline OC. After this point, MTF Alp Zero departs from Timeline OW. This version of the SCP Foundation is then created to study the device, SCP-001-8, with this founder and a group of his close friends, who would become this Foundation's Overwatch. 
Following this initial research group's discovery of other anomalous phenomena that threatened the rest of society, the team's goal expanded to research anomalies and protect the world from the danger they posed. However, the rest of the Overwatch began to age at a natural rate. While the founder didn't recognize this, he volunteered to be contained and studied, thus becoming a component of this timeline's SCP-001. Stepping back and looking at all these timelines, there seems to be a number of marked similarities, particularly relating to how the Foundation was established and how a figure, usually the one who founded the organization, possessed anomalous means of interacting with time and temporality. Under normal circumstances, interaction between alternate timelines should be impossible. But the preservation of information about all three on the SCP Foundation's database has somehow enabled all three timelines to communicate with each other. Through exchanging intelligence via their own versions of the database, all three iterations of the Foundation across the three timelines have learned that almost all of the anomalies they have encountered since being established are exclusive to their own timeline. There are a total of 17 anomalies that have been confirmed to exist across the three timelines. But there is a concerning factor in all this. The presence of an anachronistic military group referring to itself as MTF Alp Zero. This mobile task force's direct involvement in the events of both Timeline HC, where they assassinated SCP-001, and Timeline OW, where they provided schematics for SCP-001-A, raises an awful lot of questions. This MTF had to be acting on orders of the Foundation, but which version in which timeline? The consensus among the leading committees of all three, the High Command, Overseer Council, and Overwatch, is that at some unknown date in the future, each of them will inevitably send their own version of MTF Alp Zero back in time to alter the Foundation's past. And in a sense, they've already done it and seen how this altered the circumstances in order to inadvertently create the Foundation. But this poses the risk of one of these timelines overriding another, thus meaning all information garnered by alternate iterations of the Foundation could be lost. So, putting their heads together, these Foundation leading committees come to the conclusion that they need to attempt to merge all three timelines. And it seems the way to do so is using the device that Timeline OC's founder wanted to build, and that Timeline OW's founder was able to construct. This device is how this proposal for SCP-001 was given its nickname, the Noir Box. The intention of the Noir Box is to shunt all three timelines into a stable joint path, like turning loose strands into a single length of twine. As such, the leading committees of all three different timelines have agreed to share their intel on how each of them can safely create their own Noir Boxes, and all three will be used to merge the timelines. Every member of High Command, the Overseer Council, and Overwatch sign off on it. But whether or not the plan works is another matter. The fabric of time is delicate, and one wrong move could tear everything apart. The SR-47 sniper rifle slotted together effortlessly. Even after so many years of combat usage, the weapon was in pristine condition. In all the time Agent Harris had owned the gun, though, the thousands of times she'd fired it, not once had it jammed. And that was fortunate, because she had to move quickly. In a clearing about 300 meters in front of her were their targets. Capable of teleporting in a split second, she needed to be sure that her team would be able to finish the job quickly and efficiently. She looked through the scope slotted onto her rifle and kicked out the bipod, resting it on a tree stump. Now she just had to wait for the signal. She looked all around the marsh, trying her best to spot her fellow agents, but they were also well camouflaged. Even though she knew the exact spot where they would be, she couldn't see anyone. She'd always wanted to see the Himalayas. It had been on her bucket list to climb Mount Everest as a child, but the world had changed since then. Mount Everest was gone. In fact, the majority of Nepal had vanished, replaced by an enormous marsh full almost exclusively of pink ferns and droopy trees that seemed to sag to one side, unable to support their own weight. The most striking natural wonder on planet Earth had been replaced by a landscape that was flat, wet, and alien. Agent Harris curled her finger around the trigger and took aim through her sights. Two minutes passed, then the gentle whistle of a sparrow drifted over to her in the humid air. Except, of course, it couldn't be a sparrow. To the best of her knowledge, sparrows had gone extinct. 
With a snarl of anger, Agent Harris squeezed the trigger. She felt the silent sniper rifle kick her shoulder. If they wanted war, they sure as hell would get it. The destruction of the world began in 2078. Its designation was SCP Orange-A, and as often happens with these kind of things, no one saw it coming. The SCP Foundation, having dedicated decades to researching potential world-destroying events, was totally blindsided by what happened the day the weasels showed up. Weasels, you ask? That's right. But before we explain, a question for you. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now, as we were saying about the weasels. A man called Harlan Stump was the first human to make contact with the weasels. He was the groundskeeper at Site 59. Harlan was making his usual weekly trips around the perimeter of the courtyard on his ride-along lawnmower, watching baseball on his phone all the way when, out of nowhere, the aliens appeared. Just two meters in front of him, a squadron of 11 weasels materialized. The weasels, designated SCP Orange-B, stand at a minimum of three meters tall. With 16 legs and an exoskeleton carapace, they share a resemblance with terrestrial insects. Their bodies are segmented, composed of a head, primary thorax, secondary thorax, tertiary thoracic cloister, abdomen, and tail. With a hard, segmented shell covering their backs and no apparent sensory organs, aside from a radula on their heads, they are an intimidating presence. Most striking about them, however, is the most delicate part of their appearance. On their backs, each weasel has an array of flora growing in a kind of garden. It appears that each weasel has a different array of flowers growing from their backs. Understanding the meaning of these gardens can be difficult, but it appears the more extravagant it is, the higher ranking the individual weasel is. The eleven weasels that appeared before Harlan Stump each had a very vibrant garden indeed, but no more so than the weasel held aloft in an ornate palaquin. Harlan Stump stopped mowing and stared at the aliens for approximately 13 seconds at which point he let out a sigh, pressed play on his baseball game, and continued mowing the lawn. He spent too many years groundskeeping Site-59 to get spooked by anything as harmless as giant teleporting insects. Just three more weeks and he would be retired. Until then, he was avoiding nonsense like the plague. Except his phone had disappeared. Harlan stared down at the empty space, confusion knitting his eyebrows together, before looking up and seeing the handset in the hands of the alien sitting on its regal throne. The smartphone made a loud screeching noise and then all of a sudden began to flick between snippets of YouTube videos, each clip lasting just a couple of seconds. After a moment, Harlan realized that the alien was using the videos to speak to him. The words were being picked out from all these different videos to stitch together a sentence, barely. Hadily hal, neighborinos! This is Foundation. Reports indicate Foundation is, locally, the masters of the universe. Isn't that right, darling? Question mark. Keen to finish his mowing and avoid further nonsense, Harlan had to concede that he should probably talk to these aliens, if only to get his phone back. He told them he liked the gardens on their backs. Why, thank you! Gardening is kind of our thing. Well, quick question. Is your species capable of dying? Mm hmm? Harlan gulped. 
He'd been around long enough to see where this was going. The conversation was brief. Harlan kept glancing at his phone, desperately hoping that these aliens hadn't somehow broken it and that it hadn't lost his place in the match, until all of a sudden, Harlan's stump disappeared, as did his ride on lawnmower, his smartphone, and a patch of lawn, replaced by a roughly 10-meter circle of Antarctic ice and snow. No one is certain yet how the weasels are able to do it. All that is known is that they can. The phenomenon came to be known as juxtaposing. Matter from one location could be instantaneously switched with matter from a different location. It is how the weasels first arrived on planet Earth, triggering the event of SCP-001 Orange A. Orange A lasted for just two hours, but it changed the course of humanity forever. On the 29th of April, 2078, 48.52% of the Earth's habitable surface area dematerialized and rematerialized half a kilometer above the South Pole. Cities and towns from all across planet Earth, one by one, disappeared and reappeared in the air above the South Pole, where they promptly fell 500 meters, causing back-to-back -back seismic events. Washington, D.C., Beijing, and London were targeted first, followed by Tokyo, Delhi, and then a number of capital cities from Europe. This two-hour window resulted in freak weather events as minus 50-degree pockets of air, kilometers across, replaced the disappearing cities. It is disputed as to who launched the first nuclear warhead, whether it was done by accident, out of fear, or as a strategic attack against a group of weasels. Orange Dache was simply too chaotic and destructive for humanity ever to be able to know what happened in that short period of time. The result, however, was a number of nuclear explosions raging across the planet before the cities in charge of launching them were also transported to the South Pole. While the weasels were capable of experiencing juxtaposition without any apparent physical harm, terrestrial life forms were less fortunate. During the process of juxtaposition, the bonds between each and every cell are broken. While organic life does get transported to the new location, it undergoes immediate liquefaction. Not a single Earth-born life form has been observed surviving a juxtaposition event. In that two-hour window, 6.9 billion people were killed. Humanity had lost. This event triggered the use of Project Yellow, an emergency evacuation protocol that occurs at the point where the survival of the human race seems to be virtually zero. A small band of specially chosen individuals were evacuated to a pocket dimension, where they were put into cryosleep to wait until the Earth was habitable once again. In the days following the events of Orange Dache, the true invasion began. Choosing the Sahara Desert as their arrival point, the weasels started to appear in legions. Millions and millions of them filled the desert sands and went about populating their new planet. But what was their purpose? Well, fortunately, we have been able to salvage a modest amount of data that can inform us of why they're here and what their plans are. The weasel that first appeared to Harlan Stump, just outside Site-59, has been designated SCP Orange Prime. It is believed that this weasel, in particular, is their leader. Whether Prime is simply the leader of this colony or the wider species is yet to be confirmed. Security cameras were able to capture the interaction as it took place within Site-59's grounds. In their conversation, Orange Prime explains their purpose to Harlan through YouTube clips on his phone. Long story short, weasels have come from Homeworld, Dimension, for Fulfill, a long-standing mutual agreement with Cranma. This is one of many new homes. This is a pretty nice place for weasels. This land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for weasels to garden, to farm, to create beauty, to spread good vibes, to cultivate, to remake, to terraform, etc., etc. Since this encounter, no human has been able to get close enough to Orange Prime to engage the weasel in further conversation. This snippet of footage is all that humanity has to understand why this alien species has slaughtered billions of us. Four months later, Agent Harris lay flat in the marshlands, firing her sniper rifle at the weasels gathering in a clearing ahead of them. Their operation looked like overkill. It always did. It was of utmost importance that they strike quickly and without mercy. Sustained heavy gunfire from all sides, combined with RPG fire and the use of incendiary weapons made short work of the weasels. All of these weapons were necessary to pierce the heavy armor that covered their backs. 
But that was the reason it felt like overkill. It felt that way because the weasels never fought back. They would not attack, defend themselves, help their fallen allies, or even beg for their lives. They would simply stand idly by as they were gunned down. That is, until the incendiary grenades arrived. The pink ferns filling the marshlands caught fire and began to curl and smoke heavily. As soon as that happened, the weasels sprung into action, quickly splashing water onto the leaves, trying their best to save the plants. The incendiary grenades were not necessary. They did very little damage to the weasels themselves. The reason the platoons used the grenades was that it was one way they had found to distress their alien invaders in any way. It was a small revenge they could take for the billions of people who had lost their lives over the prior few months. Agent Harris pumped five extra shots into the corpse of a weasel before standing down and going to examine her handiwork. They had been hunting Orange Prime. Rumors had suggested that their primary target had been lurking in the Himalayan region, but that had obviously proven to be false. Among all the bodies on the ground, there was no sign of the fearless leader. Frustration boiled in Harris as she kicked a corpse. The thick shell hurt her foot. She must have broken her toe. At that moment, a rustling noise came from the other side of the trees. Soon, dozens more, hundreds more weasels were walking through the marsh. In a split second, her platoon opened fire. Tracer rounds lashed through the trees and the orange glow of fire danced in every direction. But there were more weasels, many more of them. Agent Harris felt her stomach knot as she fired her rifle into the crowd. There were too many, simply too many. They were going to run out of ammo before they had a chance to shoot down each and every one of them. And she was right. The firefight lasted for 30 minutes before the remaining soldier ran out of ammunition. Dozens of weasel bodies littered the marsh, floating in the water. Dozens more weasels stood encircling the group. That's when the humming started. Whenever a juxtaposition event occurs, it is always accompanied by the weasels humming to themselves. It is unclear whether this is the cause of the juxtaposition or simply a ritual that they perform. But every soldier has come to know that sound, and each one of them fears it in the pit of their stomach. So they started to disappear all around her one by one, replaced by puffs of cold air with snowflakes still gently hanging in the breeze. The human population of planet Earth dwindled as the weasel population bloomed. Large swaths of the planet were terraformed one by one to make room for alien flora. The South Pole became a larger and larger dumping ground for all the detrius that had once been the most celebrated works of the human race. The Mona Lisa was torn and forgotten, buried under many kilometers of concrete, exposed sewage works, and apartment complexes. And the situation only got worse in October. Acting against prior instructions from the Foundation, the Global Occult Coalition launched Project Popco, a 200 megaton nuclear warhead directly at a large weasel population center. As the warhead began its descent, the entire sky turned a solid dark blue. Project Popco immediately fell out of contact, as did all satellites that had been orbiting the planet. The sun, moon, and stars could not be seen. The entire sky was just a uniform dark blue. In a desperate attempt to find out what was going on, the Foundation launched a manned rocket in the direction of Popco's most recent coordinates. Contact with the rocket was lost after just nine minutes. This is the most recent known account of events from inside that rocket. All of a sudden, just a few minutes into the flight, warning alarms started going off all over the cockpit. The radar was picking up a solid object blocking their path. Gathering around the readouts, the crew came to a very quick conclusion that the dark blue that had been filling the sky was actually a solid object that was encasing the Earth. But rather than abort the mission, the crew decided to persevere. Having witnessed so much death and destruction over the previous year, they knew they would much rather go out and crashing a rocket into a blue wall than join the billions of humans liquefied in a pile in Antarctica. Closing their eyes, bracing for impact, the crew readied themselves for their now inevitable deaths, but it didn't come. Instead, the rocket was able to force its way through the dense blue object, falling apart as it went. Ground control lost contact with the ship, nothing. And then a few seconds of audio, the crew had made it. They had somehow managed to pierce their way through the blue shell that was surrounding their planet and were out into, not space. The Earth, the entire planet, had been juxtaposed. Willkommen! Bienvenue! Welcome to an exclusive behind the scenes look at Heaven. Boom. On May 12, 2588, the town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating four kiloton explosion 
accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an Ohm KA class scenario, or end of death scenario, began, in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga, dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city's center, Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and moved to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stock there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670 when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. 
At this point, SCP UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP 2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP 2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kickstarted the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zonk continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean, leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30, 2793, SCP-169 or the Leviathan emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck, but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid, which was lost beneath the ocean waves. SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU. Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile, consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk, began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned, and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There, they lived in relative safety for several months until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn crack? We've been over since Lawrence. Throwing the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. 
it for, why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, 05-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the 05 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomena. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation, SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall Carter and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The force known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once. Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. One of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. The Ikea branding was stricken from the building, and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb, seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown, but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. 
On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large, populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. On May 12th, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU manifested in Kangastok, Greenland, like something out of the most nightmarish kaiju movie never made. Soon after, there was no more death, but the world was filled with such chaos and despair that humanity longed for that eternal release. From its enormous stomping feet to its cloaca, to its face, featureless save for a gaping, grinning, devouring mouth, the entity was pure malice with all the time in the world. UBU decimated the planet, breaking the spirit of mankind and raising every city to the ground. In the earlier days of UBU's invasion, when there was still dry land and people still wanted to talk to each other rather than joining floating islands of eternal, chemically-induced slumber, they would commiserate about the shared misery of the state of things. Oh, UBU? My daughter hasn't spoken to me ever since that monster shoved my whole body down her throat someone would say. Another would pipe up, trying to one-up the first man in sort of a trauma Olympics. <laughs> Didn't you see me in the news? UBU carried me around for a week, snacking on me every now and then like I was his own personal turkey leg. It was hell. But honestly, part of me felt a little bummed out when he threw me away. Yet another person would chime in, like veterans swapping war stories over a drink at the bar. UBU made me eat a pair of my pants, whole thing, zipper and all. Then he decided he thought that was funny, Made me eat pair after pair after pair of them, rinse and repeat. By the time he got bored, I'd eaten probably around 20 pairs. I sort of got a taste for them after that. Everyone on the planet had good reason to despise SCP-UBU, but no one held more hate in his heart for the pale, wicked creature than Dr. Lawrence Michaud. Before the world was turned upside down, sometimes literally, Dr. Michaud was a member of the mysterious O5 Council at the SCP Foundation. To be specific, he was 05-11. But that prestigious position at the Foundation couldn't protect him or his loved ones from the wrath of UBU. When Dr. Michaud was off duty, UBU attacked him and his wife. First, it impaled his wife on a broom handle. Next, it threw Dr. Michaud into an open pool of sewage in the street. Then, it bathed him in the filthy water, using his screaming wife as a scrubbing brush, all the while whistling a horrible little bathtub song. Centuries after that awful experience, as Dr. McCloud watched most of his colleagues give up and choose the closest thing to death in this broken world, he became even more determined to do something about it. On January 14, 3030, Dr. McCloud abandoned the SCPS Naismith and his fellow O5 council members in search of the SCPS Corncrake, an abandoned craft to the southeast. It wasn't an easy journey, rowing all the way there in a lifeboat, never knowing when the great white beast would emerge from the water and choose him as its next unfortunate plaything. He could see the SCPS Corncrake still floating there, untouched. But before he could row any closer, something collided with the lifeboat from below, snapping it in half. Dr. McCloud's stomach dropped at the sight of pale flesh, but it was soon replaced with relief when he saw that the thing that had broken his lifeboat was not, in fact, UBU. It was an injured narwhal, behaving erratically due to its wounds. The culprit was almost certainly UBU. It wasn't content to just torment humans, 
but instead must have been targeting any life form that could feel pain and fear. In his own words, Dr. Michaud had put it, at least a mass extinction wouldn't have made it that personal. After the lifeboat broke apart, Michaud swam to the Conrig, exhaustion and cold straining his muscles. It took him two hours to reach the abandoned cargo barge and containment site, but eventually he managed to climb up over the side and get on board. There was one very special thing about the corn crate, the thing that made it worth crossing the ocean in a fragile little lifeboat to find. Every anomaly that made the Ganymede list, the list of anomalies considered too dangerous to abandon, even in an apocalyptic scenario, was contained on the corn crake. If there was anything left that the Foundation, or anyone else, hadn't tried to use to defeat UBU, it would be on that ship. After taking a little while to recover, Dr. McCloud embarked on an initial exploration of the craft. All the staff were gone, as he had expected. Thankfully, he still had his O5 ID card, and it still worked like a charm, unlocking all of the automated security systems on board. A lot of what he found was in ruins, but some things had survived. He found 10 hominid replicators from SCP-2000, in perfect working order. There was a cage containing the remains of SCP-2845, the deer, though UBU had done significant damage to it. SCP-319, a curious device, was there, contained in the space-locked vacuum chamber. This one was notable for its potential ability to destroy the universe. He found a couple of safe-class anomalies, such as SCP-YEZ, crowd control for the practical optimist, and SCP-FNA, the portable warehouse. The latter of the two was a portable door frame to a pocket dimension. He also stumbled upon SCP-001, last ride of the day, an old Prometheus Labs prototype of a time machine. And possibly, most importantly, he found SCP-076. The coffin was open, but Abel didn't attack Dr. McCloud. He wasn't consumed with murderous rage and bloodlust, the way he always was before. Instead, he was just sitting on the edge of the ship, silently staring at the sea. When he spotted McCloud, he gave him a small wave and did nothing else. The centuries of a world without death, a world without killing, without victory in battle, had taken its toll on him. For possibly the first time in his eternal life, Abel was depressed. Nine days after he first inspected the corn crake, Michal began to formulate a plan. He loaded all of the hominid receptors into SCP-FNA, using a thankfully still working forklift. Next, he was able to unseal the sealed portion of SCP-001, last ride of the day, and get his hands on the details of the anomaly. It read, SCP-001 is capable of temporarily relocating to its relative position 15,000 years prior to activation. This temporal displacement is divergent paradox irrelevant. In other words, a separate timeline is created as a landing point. For example, if an occupant from timeline X were to murder their parents in utero in timeline Y, the Y iteration of the occupant would no longer exist, but the occupant themselves, being from X, would be unharmed. When in a fully active state, SCP-001 deploys a 5-meter-high telescopic antenna that functions as a Coloco wave energy sink. Essentially, Coloco waves could only be produced as a byproduct of the universe suddenly being exterminated, and ZK-class reality failures produce the most Coloco waves. In one of these scenarios, SCP-001 would be able to use these waves to go back in time 15,000 years effectively resetting reality to a point far before the catastrophe happened. This information allowed him to put his plan together, to resurrect Project Beluga. Step 1. Plant explosive charges around SCP-319. Step 2. Hide anything potentially useful against SCP-UBU inside of SCP-FNA. Step 3. Get into the cockpit with SCP-FNA in tow. Step 4. Raise the Coloco sink. And Step 5 blow the whole thing up. Three days later, it was time to put the plan into motion. Dr. McCloud placed the charges around SCP-319's vacuum chamber. There was enough in place to implode the walls of the vacuum chamber. He closed the bulkhead and began deploying the Coloco sink. 10%, 25%, 30%. Suddenly, he could hear a loud crashing sound. The ship began to tilt. Oh no. He could hear the distant sound of menacing giggles. The sink reached 45, 57, but as UBU grew closer, he quickly overrode the system to lower the sink. 45%, 30%, 25%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 30%, 
10%. UBU grew closer and closer, and as it approached, it began to whistle the tune it once used when it bathed Mikhaud and his wife in the sewer. UBU began to pound against the blast door, becoming increasingly frustrated as it struggled to break through. Suddenly, another voice cut through the air, an unexpected one. SCP-076 Abel called out to Mikhaud, encouraging him to carry on while Abel held the beast back. As Abel and UBU engaged in an epic battle, Mikhaud suddenly remembered something. There was an express deployment module for the Coloco sink. With no time to waste, he activated it. All at once, he hit the detonator. And then, the year was 11,970, and the date was February 14th. 13,963 years later, the SCP Foundation discovered something beneath a mound of earth and snow near the northern border of Lapland, Finland. It was a shipping container with a reinforced exterior, the interior of which could only be accessed through a fortified bulkhead on one side. The words SCP-001 were written on the side in black paint. In spite of this, the object was given the designation SCP-8048. A narrow, winding tunnel through the mound of earth and snow was discovered, leading from the door to the outside world. The tunnel had significant wear, clearly having been used as a footpath by someone. But who? Well, on April 12, 1993, the Foundation got their answer. SCP-8048's bulkhead opened, and a man stepped out, snapping his fingers and promptly sealing the door behind him. He was designated Pole 8048. He was a 32-year-old man of French-Canadian descent, answering to the name of Dr. Lawrence Michaud. He made a series of claims that the Foundation found dubious, but noted it in the official file for SCP-8048 just the same. These included, but were not limited to, SCP-8048 is a time machine. He held the office of 05-11 in the year 3030 from an alternate timeline. Said timeline experienced a modified Omega K class end of death scenario that coincided with the invasion of a Tiamat class anomaly known as SCP UBU. SCP UBU was an extremely dangerous and sadistic entity who was capable of, among other things, neutralizing SCP 169 and SCP 682. His timeline's version of the Foundation launched Project Beluga, which resulted in an impossible war with SCP UBU that lasted 441 years. Paul 8048 deliberately sabotaged SCP 319 to act as a power source for SCP 8048, thus arriving in Lapland in the year 11,970 BCE. SCP UBU will arrive in Greenland on May 12, 2588. Paul 8048 was able to extend his lifespan by sharing his consciousness between a central computer within SCP-8048 and several thousand bodies created by his personal hominid replicators. Said consciousness sharing was achieved through a book classified in the future as SCP-YEZ. He wishes to assist the Foundation in the termination of SCP-UBU, and has laid out a plan for its termination as outlined in Document 8048-Zeta. There were, of course, concerns about the man's legitimacy, but after Mikhaud mentioned over 104 specific terms and data points known only to members of the O5 Council, the Foundation was forced to take him at least a little bit seriously. A motion was filed, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with the termination of SCP-UBU as per Document 8048-Zeta. O5-4 voted yay, O5-7 abstained, and the rest of the Council voted nay. The motion failed to pass. A follow-up motion was filed in response, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with their own strategy to respond to SCP-UBU. 05-1, 05-4, 05-7, and 05-10 abstained from voting. The rest voted nay. The motion failed to pass. On April 14, 1995, Dr. Isaiah Henderson and Poll 8048 sat down for an interview. When asked to state his name, Dr. McCowd also recited a mimetic passphrase that, when spoken by anyone other than 05-11 of past or present, would cause them to burst into flames. The two men were at odds from the beginning. Dr. McCowd expressed dismay and frustration that his proposal was rejected. Meanwhile, Dr. Henderson countered with the insistence that McCowd's proposed plan was rejected for posing an unnecessary risk to the civilian public. They debated for a moment, before Dr. Henderson announced the Foundation's next plan of action. Dr. McCloud was to be terminated, and the Foundation would proceed with its plans without him. At that point, Dr. Henderson terminated McCloud as ordered, 
He didn't count on one thing, though. Mikhaud was no longer an ordinary man, bound to one body. He hopped into the body of a guard, then into the body of 05-4 to deliver a vital message. He had started this plan alone, and was ready to bring it to a close alone. Project Beluga would continue with or without the Foundation's support. Dr. McCowd returned to the bulkhead, climbing back inside and sealing it behind him. He had hoped to have the Foundation behind him. He had hoped they would be allies in the fight against the greatest evil mankind ever encountered, but they disappointed him. He had waited thousands of years, only for the organization he devoted his life to to try and kill him. Well, he wasn't going to go down without a fight. This was bigger than the Foundation, bigger than anyone and no living person was as equipped to handle UBU as he was. So he resumed Project Beluga as a one-man operation. He issued a mission statement, which read as follows. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU invaded and pillaged human civilization for no other motivation than cruelty and selfish gratification. Shortly thereafter, Project Beluga was founded as a joint effort between the Goblo Occult Coalition and the SCP Foundation for the purposes of UBU's destruction. UBU is not merely a threat to human safety, it is an affront to every positive and loving concept in the human consciousness. Rather than our lives, he seeks to destroy our quality of life to sate his own sick desires. Think about it, the taste of ice cream, playing with your dog. The way you felt after your first kiss, that is UBU's sworn enemy. No faith is too cruel cool for him, no hatred is strong enough. When Project Beluga's charter was signed, 592 GOC officers and Foundation staff were present at the ceremony. Our troops numbered in the hundreds of thousands. I, Dr. Lawrence Michaud, am the only surviving member, and always will be. What I lack in numbers is compensated thousandfold by my weapons, my mind, my replicated bodies, and eons of experience. The following record serves one purpose alone, that once justice has been brought to UBU, humans in the shining and golden UBU-free future will understand that one person can accomplish through the power of hard science and raw emotion entwined in a perfect and indestructible braid. And while we are at it, you are very welcome. Over the next several hundred years, McCowd worked to secure ownership of Kangastock Greenland through a Project Beluga civilian front. He evacuated the civilian population from the area, then spent a century constructing a superweapon. With 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM in place, he was finally ready for UBU to manifest again. Ranger Halter felt the bark of the tree trunk slamming into his back, practically knocking all the air out of his lungs as he tried desperately to slow his frantic breathing. The sound of his own panting filled him with a sudden, horrifying thought. If he could hear his own ragged breaths, then it could hear them too. He clamped a hand over his mouth, clenching his jaw shut so tightly that he thought his teeth might splinter as he pushed them together. His free hand gripped the tranquilizer gun, shuddering as the snap of a twig rang out somewhere behind him. It had caught up to him already. He could bolt, make a quick dash for a cover behind another tree, but it was close enough now that it would see him. And if it did, it would come rushing after him with a speed that even a seasoned park ranger couldn't match. As much as he tried to force himself to stay still, the petrified curiosity got the better of him. Holter peeked out from behind the tree and immediately wished he hadn't. It had all started out as what sounded like an everyday occurrence. High atop his watchtower in the Glacier National Park, Ranger Holter had been enjoying the view of Montana's Rocky Mountains, a cup of coffee from his thermos in his hand. Then the familiar squawk of his radio had cut short his appreciation of the serene scenery. Holter sighed tossing the remaining contents of the cup over the tower's railing, wondering what kind of day he was in for as he went to answer the radio. Most of the time, things in Glacier Park were as peaceful as they looked, but the park ranger knew that staying vigilant could make all the difference when it came to finding a missing hiker in time, or the difference between deterring a group of campers away from a family of bears and having a hell of a mess to clean up. He pushed down on the button for the microphone, connected to the bulky radio that took up practically an entire desk. Halter, thank God, came the relieved voice from the other side. We've been trying to reach everyone, put them on alert. We've got trouble. 
Reports of a coyote gone feral attacking folks. I'm on it, Holter replied, grabbing his gear from the cramped watchtower as he continued to speak into the mic. Where did the report come in from? Not far from your station. I'd say about a click west from your position. Stowing his tranquilizer gun, Ranger Holder descended the ladder from his watchtower down to ground level. As a park ranger, Holder valued the environment he worked in. And as a fan of the SCP universe, we know how much you value intricate world building, or in some cases, world destroying. But either way, we couldn't be happier to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, World Anvil. World Anvil is a comprehensive set of world building tools that not only help you craft and organize your unique setting, but also present it in a captivating manner. From wiki-like articles and interactive maps to a full-fledged RPG campaign manager and novel writing software, World Anvil has everything a world creator could dream of. World Anvil equips you with over 25 templates, prompting you to dive deeper into your creations. Enrich your content by embedding maps, images, sound effects, and even little secrets for that immersive touch. With their innovative design, you can easily visualize your world through maps, chronicle its history with timelines, and fine-tune events with intricate details. Your crafted world can be beautifully showcased on a unique homepage, inviting others to dive into your vision. Got a sudden idea while working on another? No problem. World Anvil lets you swiftly create new articles or link existing ones, ensuring you never lose track of your inspiration. But my personal favorite feature is their interactive maps. Beyond just creating and uploading your own designs, you can directly link your creations, allowing for a dynamic and engaging experience. And if you're collaborating, invite your team to refine, write, and even let your fans chip in. I'm currently working on my own interactive map of Site-17, and maybe I'll even let you see it when I'm done. But don't wait for me. Dive into World Anvil yourself and elevate your world-building game. And here's a treat. Use our link in the description to go to worldanvil.com and use the code SCP to grab a whopping 51% off any yearly subscription. Explore, create, and share with World Anvil. The sun was already starting to dip out of sight behind the trees. Pretty soon it'd be pitch black, save for the beam of his flashlight. He had to move fast. Coyotes were only known to attack humans on rare occasions. Usually they kept away, at least enough to make them a minimal risk. But waiting for him just west of the watchtower wasn't a coyote. At least, not at first. Watching it from behind the tree moments later, Ranger Holter's stomach turned at the sight of the creature. It walked bipedally, like a human, but the shape was all wrong. Its legs looked broken, but that hadn't stopped it from catching up. Instead of bending at the knee, they were Z-shaped, pointing back behind the creature, then twisting back again in the opposite direction at the joint. They looked more like the legs of a dog, but they were far too big. The same could be said of the arms, bent out of shape at multiple points like its legs were. The creature was a mess of misshapen limbs. The cartilage in its ears had seemingly reformed into points, and there were claws protruding from its fingertips, practically bursting out from where a human's fingernails would be. But beneath it all, and what alarmed Ranger Holter the most, was its skin. It had darkened in patches, layers of fur sprouting over those areas. But there were still parts that remained clear, where skin, human skin, was still visible peeling away to reveal the new, fur-coated layer underneath. It looked like a grotesque accident, like something ripped straight out of an old horror movie, the kind of monster that a mad scientist would make by haphazardly splicing DNA and playing God. Holter checked the tranquilizer gun in his trembling fingers, still empty after that most recent shot. He reached for another dart, slowly sliding it into the loading mechanism and readying the pistol. It cocked and made a sound. The creature's malformed head turned, snapping directly towards the source of the noise, directly towards Holter. He turned to sprint away, trying to expand the distance between him and it. If he was too close, the dart wouldn't have enough momentum when he pulled the trigger. The toe of his boot snagged on something solid, unmoving, a root from the tree he'd been hiding behind. He felt himself tumble, landing with a hard thud against the forest floor. His gun, it had fallen from his grasp. He scrabbled around in the dirt for it, barely able to see where the tranquilizer had landed in the dark. Just as his fingertips brushed past something metal, Holter felt the force of something heavy strike his back again. This time, though, it wasn't a tree. It was the creature. It snarled, gnashing its canid jaws that were protruding out of its skull, rows of sharp teeth that had uprooted the old ones burying themselves into the park ranger's neck and not letting go, until he'd stopped moving. 
for good. A few short hours later, a convoy of mysterious unmarked vehicles arrived at Glacier National Park. The rest of the park rangers, who had reported the strange activity, were approached by shadowy figures who refused to give their names or offer up any form of identification other than just referring to themselves as experts in things like this. Not long after, none of the others would remember Ranger Holter or the incident that had led to his untimely death. After administering amnestics, it didn't take the SCP Foundation search party long to discover a lone coyote sniffing around the remains of a park ranger covered in blood. The wild animal was captured, to be brought back for testing before being re-released into the wild. Meanwhile, the Foundation scoured the rest of the area, until they came across the real culprit. Standing in a clearing a short distance from a footpath through the forest was SCP-1579. Of course, the next challenge was getting it packed up and transported to Biosite-66 without touching it. To the untrained eye, SCP-1579 looks to be fairly unassuming, even as far as anomalous objects go. It is simply an old wooden sculpture, the kind that can even be occasionally found in various wooded areas throughout the world. Its age is apparent from even one cursory glance at SCP-1579, the partial damage to its cedar surface speaking to the numerous years it has existed for, along with the bright green moss that covers it. Although, curiously, this moss doesn't seem to dry out and die in responses to changes in humidity, nor does it affect SCP-1579's structural integrity. As for where it came from, and who made it, those are still unknown. As if the answer to what holds SCP-1579's anomalous properties, whether or not the cedar it was carved from or the moss coating the sculpture possesses some unknown properties, or if SCP-1579 was somehow imbued with these after being created. Initial testing by the SCP Foundation's researchers determined SCP-1579 to have an abnormally high resistance to the type of damage wood, and particularly cedar wood, is susceptible to. For one, it does not seem to show any signs of rotting or natural degradation. For another, it is also resistant to heat, at least to a certain extent. It doesn't burn the same way other objects constructed from cedar wood. However, this sculpture is not entirely indestructible. Pieces can be easily chipped off of the main body of SCP-1579, and these splintered fragments continue to carry the same anomalous effects as the rest of the sculpture, even when separate from it. But of course, you want to know about the creature. How does this supposedly harmless, if a little structurally abnormal cedar wood sculpture connects to whatever it was that killed Park Ranger Holter? Well, it's quite simple actually. SCP-1579 killed Holter. Not directly, you understand, but by proxy, through its further anomalous properties. Still confused? Well then, how about a demonstration? Let's take a look at one of the Foundation's preferred test subjects, an expendable member of D-Class personnel, probably spending multiple life sentences working here at the SCP Foundation rather than behind the bars of a maximum security institution. Now, what would happen if you place this delightful individual in the same room as SCP-1579? Well, nothing initially. That is, until the subject touches the cedar wood surface of the sculpture, either out of curiosity or following the instructions of a Foundation researcher. That's when the real anomaly starts. The wooden sculpture will exhibit a slight but observable movement, shuddering slightly as if moved by an unseen force. This will precede the person who touched the object feeling a burning sensation, that kind of irritating, painful heat that spreads underneath the surface of the skin. The burning will always begin at the area of their body that made direct contact with SCP-1579, and touching it again at any point will trigger a reactivation of the sculpture's anomalous effects. Subjects experiencing the effects of SCP-1579 have described the feeling as being akin to a bad sunburn, that rapidly spreads across the skin from the point of contact, only to stop once it has affected a person's entire body. Following the subsidence of the burning sensation, subjects experiencing the side effects of touching SCP-1579 will notice an immediate change to their skin. Within a window of three minutes, their skin becomes thin and paper-like in its texture, before starting to peel away. Once this stage occurs, the peeling skin will reveal a new layer underneath, hence the colloquially used codename for this anomaly, Different Skin. 
However, this so-called different skin isn't merely a new layer of otherwise ordinary human skin. Instead, it will belong to another species entirely. A person coming into contact with SCP-1579 will find themselves rapidly developing new skin that shares the physical traits, as well as matching DNA, to that of a number of animal species. It should be noted that these features will continue to rapidly develop until the subject is entirely transformed and is no longer considered to qualify as a human being. As for the specific transformation that occurs, there are a number of known outcomes that repeat in the following cycle. Let's say our D-Class, we'll call them Subject A, touched SCP-1579 at the start of the cycle. They would, after the burning sensation stops and peeling begins, start to sprout dark feathers across their torso, arms, and upper legs likely with a great deal of pain as the sharp quill of these feathers start to burst out from beneath the skin. Beneath the knees, Subject A will see their legs start to become yellow and scaly, as well as a change that causes their toenails to simply start to painfully protrude outwards until they form pointed, blackened talons. Subject A's face will also start to grow feathers, however these grow outwards away from the areas of the nose and mouth. Flight feathers will also protrude from the forearms multiplying in number until their entire body is covered, at which point Subject A, on every level including genetically, more closely resembles a Corvus Corax, more commonly known as the common raven, than a human being anymore. Take another test subject, Subject B, and get them to touch SCP-1579 right after. Their different skin is covered in brown fur that's approximately four inches long, their lips and skin underneath the fur will darken, and their nose will become constantly moist. Claws will start to grow from their fingertips, although these will be notably smaller than those of a fully grown creature of the same species, an Ursus arctos horribilis, or a grizzly bear. Then we get to the point in the cycle where some unwitting hiker encountered SCP-1579 in the forests of Glacier National Park, Montana. When this subject, Subject C, touched the cedar sculpture, their skin began to grow layered fur, as the cartilage of their ears is separated from their tissue and replaced by new, reshaped cartilage. Much like Subject B, who SCP-1579 turned into a grizzly bear, Subject C also had darkened skin, a moistened nose, and longer, sharper nails. It was at some point during this transformation that an unassuming park ranger stumbled upon Subject C, frightened by what he saw. This ranger was unable to identify that what he interpreted as attacks by some kind of half-human, half-animal hybrid were actually desperate pleas for help as Subject C was transformed into a coyote. Although it's hard to say which physiological change triggered by SCP-1579 is the most alarming or unpleasant to experience, the fourth kind is in no way any more pleasant than the preceding three in the cycle. Subject D of this particular series of tests will find the new layer of skin that emerges under the old to be hairless and of a green coloration, often with brown markings. Unlike the previous instances, their skin will rapidly begin to dry out and seems to be far more reactive to the humidity of the surrounding environment. It is also far thinner than that of the skin possessed by other transformations that SCP-1579 causes. So thin, in fact, that the eyeballs of Subject D will be visible through its eyelids, which rapidly become translucent, similar to those of the Pseudacris regula, otherwise known as the Pacific Tree Frog. Repeated activation of SCP-1579's anomalous properties will trigger the next transformation in the cycle, whether the cedarwood sculpture is touched by a new subject or repeatedly by the same person. In the latter instance, where a subject is re-exposed to SCP-1579, the additional changes their body undergoes will be significantly more painful. Their already newly replaced outer layer of skin will fail to dry out and will begin bleeding instead. Three or four consecutive exposures to SCP-1579 will lead to excessive bodily trauma for the subject, usually causing them to die from shock before the fourth transformation is complete. And as we're sure you can imagine, an amalgamation of a human, a raven, a grizzly bear, a coyote, and a tree frog is hardly a pleasant sight. This unfortunate fate was suffered during one of the first incidents with SCP-1579 that brought the Foundation's attention to it. During an elementary school field trip, a teacher who was explaining the history of totem poles in Native American culture accidentally touched SCP-1579. While experiencing the pain of her transformation, she fell against the sculpture in a panic, 
not realizing it had been what caused her to change. This repeated triggering of the object's anomalous effects led to her untimely death, an event that had to be wiped from the minds of her students by the Foundation using the careful application of Class B amnestics. For now, SCP-1579 is kept in a secure, sterile environment at a Foundation storage warehouse, where personnel are not permitted to make any contact with it, so there's no need to worry about accidentally running into SCP-1579 in the wild. Although, there are always plenty of other things to worry about while out on a hike through the forest. Things that could be right behind you. Now check out SCP-173 The Sculpture and SCP-1897 Human Domestication Society for more.